D. P. 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 The Steve Dangle Podcast. With your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go! We're going to get flagged on YouTube for that. What? Because I showed my tatas? They're going to take us down. You can't do that. They're real and they're perfect. Thank you. <laughs> they're not. Oh, gosh. gosh. They're Thanks. not. No, they're not. Okay. So many hours on the couch earning those tatas. Anyway, oh, good morning, no. good afternoon, good evening, however you're listening. Um, guys, this is the shortest show we've ever had. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Specifically, though, I think the most important thing that we need to talk about <laughs> is the return of somebody who we thought was gone forever. Mm. Um, this could be the greatest comeback in the history of sports, and that is Andrew Ferentz coming back to the Edmonton Oilers and stealing the captaincy away from Connor McDavid. Unbelievable. Wow. The, the wow. greatest the greatest captain the Oilers have ever had. Now, if you don't know what I'm – I remember when he signed there, actually. He was like uh, – they are like, oh, Andrew Ferentz, real leader. Uh, he uh, he leads a youth workout program in Edmonton in the in the summer in the mornings. And I was like, oh, that's nice. And then the Oilers seems played like that year. He's a great guy. Like, oh, he seems awesome. Then the Oilers played that year, and I was like <sighs> – they that's, they went through win. uh, they went through a long phase of exactly what the Leafs went through, where they would sign exactly one person who had previously won a championship and be like, "Our work here is done. Yeah, we're good the, now." The seventh most important person on the Stanley Cup winning team. That will be our guy. Yeah. Uh, and done. <laughs> Strode to the cup. Here we come. Now, and uh, it didn't work. Like, if you don't know here. why I'm bringing up Andrew Ferentz. Uh, Former and current captain of the Oilers. Sorry, Connor McDavid. You'll you'll just have to come play for the Leafs. Um, uh, what am I talking about? Where is this coming from? So uh, TNT, who we talked about last episode, uh, they got the secondary rights deal, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, the NHL in the states. Um, they and it, <laughs> they put up this graphic announcing, "Hey, guess what? Hockey's back on TNT." And they had a graphic that featured two star players in the league. Alexander Ovechkin and Andrew Ferris. <laughs> oh, that's you know, just captain of the Oilers, Andrew Ferris. He's a star. Oh, that's so funny, man. That's so fun. And listen, hey, I work for Sportsnet. Uh, we've had we've had some. Uh, TSN has had some. Man, the infamous Lupal one on TSN on Trade Center Oof. one day. Man, that was so. That was I've told the story before, but that was my buddy's job for years and years. And I texted him as soon as that happened. I'm like, "Oh my god, are you okay?" And he's like, "This is my first year not doing it." Oh. And whoo, guess they needed him. Whoo, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess so. The funny now, thing about so, the Ferens thing is that it's the first thing that pops up in Google when you uh, when you Google image Oilers captain. Andrew oh, Ferris no. is the first thing that pops up. Oh, so everybody wow. on Twitter is like, so the guy making your graphics didn't know anything about hockey and just Googled Oilers captain oh. and picked the first image. And it's the exact oh. same one on Google Images. Mm. It's very oh, funny. No. <laughs> like they could have picked Sidney Crosby. Nobody would have been upset about that to American teams. It's an American yeah. network. Like why yeah, not? It doesn't Sid? make sense to have an Oiler anyway. Well, he's the uh, biggest star in the league, but yeah. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, but no you, one's like, oh, yeah, I want to watch Edmonton. Well, maybe do you guys want to hear Shaq talk about hockey, because in the clip More where they showed the graphic, it was Shaq talking about hockey. And then nobody really watched the clip. They just focused on the graphic. Yes. So I'm going to play You're you right. the 25 yes. seconds of Shaq talking about hockey. If you want to hear it. Oh, oh my God. Thank you. Right. In, into my veins directly. I don't have any. Shaq, how was your NHL knowledge? I don't have any. Can you name? Three NHL teams. New Jersey Devils, California Kings, <laughs> LA Kings. Okay, thank you. So, don't play. You can't get the whole state. LA Kings and the Chicago. Bru- not Bruins. Blackhawks. <laughs> all right. Hey, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> what do you? you how do you it. rate his NHL skills? Better uh, than I thought. I mean, bro, he played for the Lakers. Like, how does he how does he get the California Kings? He played for the Lakers too, though, like when the when the Kings stunk. Like it was right after the Gretzky era. That's right. True. That's but they true. shared a building. Actually, 
you're they you're didn't. gonna you're gonna want to Google <laughs> Shaq, and then yes, so did the Clippers, and no one liked them either. So That's true. Yeah. Name but Clippers from that time. No one you, can. You should Google Shaq New Jersey Devils and see what pops up. You're gonna get a little surprise. To save everybody who can't Google it very quickly, Shaq did the ceremonial puck drop before a New Jersey Devils game a few years ago, and he was wearing a Ponikarovsky jersey. Al, Alex Ponikarovsky, because I Devils. guess it's the longest name and it's the only one that would fit on his back. I don't know. Maybe he was just the tallest guy on the team. He could have been. I loved Pony. I miss Pony. Why? I don't know. It was just, you, you get attached to the best players on shitty teams. You know what I mean? You know, uh, I also miss perennial underperformer Alex Ponikarovsky when they teamed him up with Nick Andropov and then the guy who was actually good, Matt Sundin. Matt Sundin, and they were nicknamed the Skyline, and Bill Waters would get on the radio and jokingly call him, no, they're, they're, they're flatline. They yeah. suck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did. You guys remember Mojo Radio? I do. Anyway. Um, I remember when Matt Sundin had actual wingers, like Alex McGilney. Gary Roberts. Steve Thomas. Jonas Hoagland. Okay, Ooh. well, it's not Steve as long a list as you Stop it. Um, hey, so... It was on Team Sweden. Uh, th- there's, there is lots to talk about, including that TNT uh, information. And I actually want to relay a story, and he might tell this on the 31 Thoughts podcast, but just in case you miss it, Elliot Friedman actually wrote something very interesting about the NHL rights deal shifting in 2014-2015 in the 31 Thoughts column this week. And I thought it was really great because Elliot rarely makes it about himself. But his personal experience on this one was like really, really interesting. So uh, I think we got to get into that. There's a lot of stuff to talk to. Uh, you know, the Leafs have clinched a playoff spot, Yay! which means they're not going to miss the playoffs two years in a row because, guys, guess what? They missed it last year. Everybody kind of forgets that. But let's get into who wore the crown, brought to you by Jesse. Actually, today's episode well, is you, brought Jesse. to you by Jesse. Oh. oh. Yeah. So I didn't know today's that. episode, I. Um, I left it blank on purpose. I didn't schedule it from the many DMs that I have to get back to. And if you have DM'd me in the last like week, I haven't responded to you yet. I'm still filling out the calendar. We are through June 3rd with Who Wrote the Crown booking. So I think I'll go up until the uh, end of when the Stanley Cup Finals is going to be, and then I'll cut it off there. But yeah, I got to get back to you on DM if you have DM'd me. But today's Who Wrote the Crown segment is brought to you by Jesse Blake because I made a donation and I'm challenging you, Steve, and you, Adam to beat my donation so today in toronto our good friend fourth member of the show cj chris johnston ran a marathon he has run every single day for the last 365 days and today he said on the one year uh his 365th run he was going to run a full marathon in support of conquer COVID 19. so elliot friedman was out there he was watching him run his marathon and he did it in a time of three hours and 39 minutes and 45 seconds so we have to shout out uh reporter chris today for doing his job and running again i don't know if he's going to keep running tomorrow but we'll see and he wore he he wore a t-shirt that says juggernaut across the front so this whole thing, his running project was to uh, raise money for Conquer COVID-19. If you go to idrf.ca, you can donate there yourself if you'd like to. It's also on his Twitter. Find it there. I donated personally this morning because I'm a great person. $200. Mm-hmm. And I texted him oh. and I told them I donated that. And, and I congrats on your run and keep running. So Steve and Adam, because you aren't as great as people as I am, you haven't donated yet. And I'm challenging you right now for who are the crown to make a donation. You know, well, $200 and one cent coming your way. Well, you know, <laughs> sometimes they say if I was half the man, Jesse was. Well, I am exactly half the man Jesse was because I donated a hundred bucks today. <laughs> so nice. I got I got another hundred dollars and, and two cents, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. To go. All right. All right. I will get there, Jesse. I will get there. What awesome. a guy. What a guy. I like it. I'm into it. Um, so that was brought to you by, I guess, Jesse Blake. And you know what? We'll, we'll give it to Chris. Chris is the sponsor of, of, of uh, the uh, Crown segment. And I got to ask, uh, who wants to go first? Does anybody have any thoughts? Adam, I'm feelings. You, you, haven't, you haven't set it up. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. You I'm sorry. You haven't. Can you just? This is Who Wore the Crown. Brought to you by one Chris Johnston. The next time that you decide, today I'm going to be fit forever. <laughs> kind of like Sean McKenzie. 
Definitely like CJ. And I'm going to be a better person than everybody else. Definitely like CJ. Why not? Juggernaut! <laughs> Run for 365 straight days to conquer COVID-19. Unbelievable. God, I love CJ. Anyway, uh, uh, all right, who wants to go first? I'll go first because I have a special crown to hand out today because I didn't think it ever get to this point where I would be giving young Adam Brooks a crown. So I just want to give Adam Brooks my crown today because he has solidified the fourth line on the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's Spets on the wing, Thornton on the wing, Brooksy in the middle. And it is so much fun to watch. He was awesome last night. And I can't wait to see them run in the playoffs with this fourth line. I don't think nobody who comes back is going to kick him out of that slot if he keeps playing like this over the next, what is it, seven games they have left? I think that's that's the fourth line you got to run with in the playoff and fill out everything else. Engvall, I'm sorry. You had every chance in the history of the Leafs. Like, nobody's <laughs> given you any more chances than you've had this last, like, four months. But you didn't take the slot. And um, Adam Brooks, congrats. I think that fourth line center spot is yours. You're phenomenal. Here's a crown. He's been so good that, like, forget Engvall. People are talking about taking out Galchenyuk when Hyman comes back. It's oh, well, I've I, a lot of people tweeted it at me. They're like, who comes out? Is it Brooks or Galchenyuk? And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, listen, there's, there's a healthy argument. It, well, then who's your who's the third line? Uh, I guess it just stays as it is. Right? So Kerfoot, it, it, uh, Kerfoot. Kerfoot centering Simmons, Simmons and McKayev. All right. McKayev. McKayev's who I was forgetting. Yeah, I guess there's no there's no room. Where do you listen? Galchenyuk's not going to center that the fourth line. Like, I don't think you're not scratching any of the old guys. So, who's like, moving up? Make peace with that. Hyman comes back. Uh, Hyman, Hyman would go into the but Galchenyuk. They, they want spot. Hyman on the third line. So, what are they going to do? I think no, you're right. Then you got Felino, th- who has his spot now and doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. Mm-hmm. I think good teams have good extras. Yeah. <laughs> it might be Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Joe Thornton and Jason Spets, a known centerman, uh, I'm sure they can handle it at seven or eight minutes a night. Like, I'm, I'm sure they can. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be all right. But that fourth line, Jesse, absolutely right. And it was funny. Right before he scored last night, I said to nobody in particular, um, boy, Adam Brooks looks good. And mm-hmm. scored. And I was like, Adam Wilde, you're a genius. Again, <laughs> nobody in particular. Um, Which put you on the broadcast. Third man yeah, in the booth. Oh, man. <laughs> man. Here's Chris Cuthbert, Chris Simpson, Adam Wilde. What do you Adam think, Adam? Wild. Well, not much. I not ate much. the purple well, berries. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's it's funny the uh uh the thing with him is he's and i and i i i don't want to i don't mean this to be insulting but we have found a spot for joe thornton on this team because of yeah. the emergence of adam brooks and i yeah. don't the thing the reason i want i want there to be a spot for joe thornton on this team i want him to be playing i love the passion that he showed but there was like seven or eight games there guys where it was like I don't know. Yeah, it was a little longer than that. <laughs> it was a little longer than that. Right? It was sort yeah. of like, where does this go? And yeah. uh, I want to remind everybody that Jason Spezza has more points than Josh Anderson this season. No. Pretty sure. Yeah. No. Here, let me look at it one more time. Spezza has how many points? Jason Spezza, stats.nhl.com. He's got 26 points. Josh Man. Anderson, Mr. Anderson. Has no, are you ready? No, no, 24 points. Get out of absolute town, really. Yeah, oh dear. Oh, why, heavens. why, why the comparison to Josh Anderson? Why did we cherry pick him to be a because, dick, Jesse? I'm trying to, like, just because if you're a Montreal Canadiens fan, you're like, fuck, what else am I gonna say to that? Okay, <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> like, yeah, why, why was that, picking was on big, him? that was the big get. And now it's like, well, Jason hey, Spets has got more points. Jesse, oh, so that's that's another shot across the bout, Mike Babcock. Jesse, <laughs> counterpoint. No. I don't feel bad at all. That shit's good, hilarious. Keep argument. going. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Steven, your crown. Well, <clears throat> folks, Austin Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you not, right? That goal Dude, was insane. What a mutant. What oh, a yeah. oh. He's he scored a goal so sexy he surprised himself, and it wasn't even the nicest 
batting the puck out of the air to himself, followed immediately by a goal, goal that he has scored in that building. Mm -hmm. He scored a very similar goal off the rush with Patrick Marlowe on his line in 2017 in La Centre Belle, Montreal. It's, uh, uh, what, what, what do you say? What do you say? What do you do? What do you, what do you do except hand him the crown, hand him the key to the city, make him prime minister, what, uh, make him ambassador to Mars. Like what, what else do you do? This is the best player that's ever played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And here's how good Connor McDavid is. He is probably never going to win the heart ever once. And people are going to be one day. We're going to be talking about Matthews going to the hall of fame and we're going to be talking about individual hardware. And, ah, yeah, but where's the hearts? Yeah, he'll have con smites. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, man. That's what I'm hoping. That's yep. definitely what I'm hoping. I also think you... And a few Rockets. Matthews has a thing where we're, we're going to... Your other fans from other markets are going to laugh at me here. But I think you do have, play at a bit of a disadvantage playing in Toronto because the writers here like to be... First off, more writers are here. And they like to be hipster about it. That's why they picked Taylor Hall over Connor McDavid in 2017. Oh, well, the Oilers aren't going to the playoffs. Mm. Fuck you. He's the best player in the league. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, this year, it's Connor McDavid's trophy. Stop giving it to Leon Dreisaitl. Even Leon's like, I don't understand. I don't, Leon Dreisaitl's not over. Leon Dreisaitl without Connor McDavid. I think Connor McDavid over. is Connor McDavid without Leon Dreisaitl. And that's not to diminish Leon Dreisaitl. Connor McDavid is a, a step above everybody in this league. Everybody, including the people who are right next to him. And you know, it's, he, it's right now, Connor McDavid is on a point per period pace in the last 13 <laughs> periods. I mean? In the last That's in the last 13 <laughs> periods, he has 13 points. He's on a point per period. There's, take Outrageous. a second to just appreciate how crazy that stat is. Every mm-hmm. period he has a point. The last 13 okay, periods. Adam, who wears your crown? Because I want to continue this. Um, uh, (laughs) Sir Jack of Campbell. Uh, I just want to say, nice to have him back in in form a little bit recently, especially. Um, And, you know, last night, saving 33 of 34, a nice clean, or sorry, 32 of 33, a nice clean 970 save percentage. Let's go through Jack Campbell's record for the season, guys. Can we just do that for just two two seconds? I bet it's bad. 11 and 0, and then... No, 14, I bet it's bad. 2, and 1. Wow. Again, it's 14, 2, and 1. Now, I know that he went on a bit of a winning streak there that was historical, and people were like, well, he had a bit of a hot streak, and maybe the last couple of games he wasn't very good, and whatever. Guys, he's 14, 2, and 1. That's huge. That's yeah. big. Yes, I know the team's good. Jack Campbell has been spectacular. He had a couple of wobbly games. Tell me who does it. Show me a goalie that doesn't. And uh, I think this guy's for real. This is awesome. And I think we got to give, we got to give him a little more credit than we're giving him. Cause remember this up until this season, the Leafs defense was awful. And you had to look to like the most advanced stats you possibly could to go, well, it's maybe going in the right direction. This year, Leafs defense has been better, pushing shots to the outside. They've done a lot of what Tampa Bay did a couple years ago uh, with the, the amendments to their, to their system and how they play defensively. Um, and obviously, the addition of TJ Brody helps. The emergence of Rasmus Sandin helps. The Zach Bogosian being as good as he's been um, and, and Justin Hall. All of these things coming together at once is great. But we've seen what happens when we don't have a great goalie in that. Mm-hmm. We've seen Hutch. No offense to Hutch. He had a shutout. He's still been, he's been better this year. And uh, Big Save Dave hasn't been great. And when Big Save Dave's in net, do the Leafs look great? They do not. Not, not the really, answer is no. they do not look dominant. Well, hopefully that answer will be out of date by the end of tonight. Why is that? He's getting the start against Vancouver, it is looks he? like. Okay, yeah, well, there you go. Looks like. So anyway, that's my crown. And that is Who Wore the Crown brought to you by Chris Johnson, who wants to cover, uh, sorry, conquer COVID-19 on his own. Just him. <laughs> We're sending him in. He's going he's gonna to administer every vaccine. Yep. And on he, his own. On his own. Confirmed. And also break a few trades. Thank you, Chris, for what you do. Remember, oh, what's boy. the uh, website again? Uh, so if you go to his Twitter, it is there at reporter Chris, or you can go directly to idrf.ca slash project slash conquer COVID-19. So the next time you want to be an inf- in shape person and just overall a better person than anybody else, why not? I'm the juggernaut, Chris.
Why not? See, it's like, it's like the line. It's Thank like you the for line. listening to Who Wore the Crown. I think we need to be honest with each other. I know some of us, maybe you, are sleeping with something saggy and old and in desperate need of an upgrade. You deserve better. It's time to break up with your mattress and give yourself an upgrade with Helix. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes and it matches your body type and sleep preferences for the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting the mattress that would be perfect for the way you sleep. Do you sleep on your back? Do you sleep on your stomach? How much do you weigh? What's your partner sleep like? Helix asks you all about that. And Helix knows that everybody's unique. So there's a ton of different mattresses to choose from. Soft, medium, firm. Mattresses are great for cooling you if you get hot when you sleep like me. And even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. So if you're looking for a great sleep, go to helix.com slash SDP and take their two minute sleep quiz. They'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And here's the thing, 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They will even pick it up for you if you don't love it but you'll love it. So check it out. Helix is offering $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash SDP. That's helixsleep.com slash SDP for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Now, we, you guys want to talk about Connor McDavid for a second before we get yeah. into the Leafs, right? A little. The okay, 100 point thing is getting stupid. <laughs> like if dude, he's almost there. It's it's ridiculous if he if he gets a hundred points in fifty six games, like that's yeah. that's that's the best pace since Mario Lemieux peaked in the nineties. So what is what's he at right now? Because I know they played last night, but I I missed it. Points wise, McDavid. Yeah, last I checked, he was at eighty one in forty six. I think he's at so eighty four in oh forty seven. He had eighty four. Yeah. Stop. Stop. Okay, so I need to amend my little tweet then uh, that I was about to read because that, that, that Connor, you forget. <laughs> How is this possible? Okay, so he is officially on a. We clip that, by the way. That was a that was quite the reaction. <laughs> <laughs> he made me just, malfunction. Just anything happens. Steve goes. <laughs> so okay, here's what I tweeted. Connor McDavid is on pace for ninety eight. Point six points in 56 games. By the way, updated after one single game, uh, 100 points flat. He is on pace for 100 points. Let's uh, round up and say 99, I said. No, let's say 100, Stephen. Uh, that would give him more points in a 56-game season than five uh, of the 20 Art Ross Trophy winners, so scoring title winners, since the year 2000. His pace is one point back, now tied, of the 2017 winner, Connor McDavid. Unbelievable. He's, he's, <laughs> if he gets 100, he'll have more points or as many, now that we can add 2017 in there, than more than 25% of the scoring title winners since the year 2000. Yes, that includes Marty St. Louis from 2013. Um, the short the 48 game season, but he only had 60 points. That pace, not even close, not even close. What Connor McDavid is doing this season is special, truly, truly special. And he's been held off the score sheet. I believe it was in nine games yeah. this season. So <laughs> mostly against the Leafs on this pace, right? Three and of them like, were against the Leafs consecutively and three were against Montreal. I forget the other three, a game uh, like but, Winnipeg. It's, Two nights Wild. ago, he's playing Winnipeg and he has a hat trick. It was a Monday night and they, they sat up like he played 16 minutes that night and he had four points. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, he's just, like Steph he's, Curry. He's taking, <laughs> he, he took the fourth quarter off because he had too much points. <laughs> like, oh my God. He's so far and away above better than everybody else in the NHL that it's starting to be absurd. Well, that's why I was trying to say earlier about the uh, Leon Dreisaitl thing. It's, it's not that Leon, I would want to diminish Leon's talent. It's just that anybody next to Connor McDavid seems like an ant. He's a giant. He's yeah. unbelievable. And I mean, he's no Andrew Ference, but he's quickly going to become the face of this league. And it'll be Horkoff. nice with a little bit of Sean Horkoff. Uh, <laughs> do you remember, by the way, when Sean Horkoff re-signed in Calgary? Sorry, in Edmonton. 
And the Calgary Flames Twitter account said, what a stupid deal, idiots. And then like, oh, yeah. and there was somebody that meant to do it from their own Twitter account, but was signed into the Flames Twitter account. And they got fired. I didn't I know it was so Horkoff. I do remember. And it was, yeah, he signed for two years, five million a piece. And that was a lot of money for Sean Horkoff. And then, and then, yeah, it was like, what a dumb deal this is. It's idiots. Like- from the official <laughs> Flames account. <laughs> That's amazing. No, they should have right. given that guy a promotion. Come on. I think so. Battle of Alberta. Um, How dare you? I think, uh, I think, you know, uh, I do want to do talk AGM. about Oilers a little bit later in the show too, guys. So let's save some of this. Uh, sure. But if if Connor McDavid hasn't been on your radar all year, he should be. And I'm excited to see what happens to Connor McDavid's career after the ESPN and the TNT deals kick in. Because um, with a wider audience, hopefully in the States, uh, a lot of new people, he's going to be one of the guys that they look to to go, wow, this is the most exciting player in the world. And mm-hmm. um, I think, you know, just entering his prime, because he's what, 24? Uh, yeah, they're about so his, so his, his prime years or his next six, um, uh, we're going to see some pretty spectacular hockey over the course of this ESPN TNT deal. And uh, I think they're going to be rewarded for it. It's going to be a very, very cool time, I think, and hope to be a hockey fan. Now, let's get into the Leafs here. Who uh, And I want to read a tweet to you guys because there's a bit of a weird one around this. And it comes from uh, our guy, Terry Koshin, who we think is a great person. We love Terry, right? Yes. Steven? Big Terry fan. Big, Big Terry, Terry fan. fan. Per the NHL, and I love that he said that, Per the NHL, Matthews and Marner joined Coverley, Williams, Salming, and Turnbull as the only Leafs in the expansion era to reach the postseason in each of their first five seasons. Wow. Except. Really? Except what? They didn't make uh, the postseason last year. Yes, they Except did. They did somehow. They didn't they make made the, the postseason. They made Not the, the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yes. All right. Because right. they, the Toronto Maple Leafs were in the NHL playoffs. They were in the NHL playoffs. No, they were in the NHL postseason. They were not in the playoffs. They were in the NHL playoffs. They were not in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And this oh, is the difference. That's what it is. This is the difference, right? What a ah. little shit that record is. That's crap. It is. There's definitely an asterisk on it. I mean, if you're Cabrillé and for some reason you're dug in about that shit in between like Uber <laughs> shifts, like he ran. By the way, what the, that's not a dig at Cabrillé. He literally. Pretty sure he like co-owns a restaurant or his wife. Yeah, his wife, his wife he was making deliveries in the peak of the pandemic last uh, like April through May ish. Uh, Caberlet was helping his wife with deliveries for the restaurant that I believe they both own. And he would do the Uber deliveries and drop them off himself. And you just be in your Toronto place ordering uh, chicken fried rice and Caberlet would show up at your door with a bag and drop it off. It's, it was pretty cool yeah. pictures oh. to see. That guy looked just like Thomas Copperley. <laughs> I met him once. He's a nice guy. Is he? Yeah. yeah nice. Quiet. Very quiet. Very, very mm. quiet. But but nice. Um, so and it, it doesn't doesn't help that I it was at Sick Kids Hospital. <laughs> That's when I was working there. And uh, why and did you start thinking. telling this depressing story? <laughs> it's not depressing. <laughs> Everything was okay. It was just he was there and he was in the lobby and and uh, I just kind of waved and he kind of waved back and that was it. Adam, in retrospect, I was nineteen and I was working there. In retrospect, I probably shouldn't have waved. But I was 19, man. And he's, he was Thomas Coverley. You just ended the show for a second time. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm that was so a sorry. Steve level story. <laughs> you know? <Yeah>. And, <laughs> what a shame. And then Steve he story. caught a football and fell off a balcony. Tell a zoo story, you stupid dick. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so the Leafs clinch a playoff spot. Thornton's and Spets had both hit milestones in the same night. Thornton with 11 hundred assists Goofy. jason spezza moving into i think it was 99th place on all-time scoring list who did he pass i don't know who did he pass maurice richard oh right yes wow. of course that's pretty cool it is pretty cool in montreal no less will maurice we know we know all the asterisks calm down it's neat that's all if you had the chance guys it like so jason spezza has had knocks on him his entire career but if you're the scout, I mean, not that he, not that we didn't see this coming with him, he was going to be a good player. But if you have the chance at a first overall pick, and you're told at the end of his career, he will be in the top 100 scores of all time, that's a pretty big win, right? It's a good like, pick. People look at Jason Spezza sometimes. I feel like because there was deficiencies in his in his defensive game, and he never uh, turned into like Jonathan Taze. And Jonathan Taze wasn't even in the NHL at that point. 
but you know, he was always just the offensive guy. Uh, I think any scout anywhere takes top hundred score all time, any day, any day. And there were, remember how hard it was for him to even make the senator. Jacques Martin kept sending him down. I, uh, I do seem to remember something like that. Yeah. Like it was like two or three years. And then he finally was like, okay, are, am I going to make this? Or are you just going to trade me? And then they, they finally, good. and they let him on the team and he scored a bunch. Yeah, They were, they were really good. And he was also sort of part of that. I want to say he was just as he was sort of getting his footing he was part of that um, that crop of ridiculously young and talented players who sort of had their career put on hold by the full season lockout. Yes, it was like he. It was like it was guys like he, he was torturing the AHL. I think Getzlaff might have been in there. Eric Stahl, like just all these guys who had no business being in that league, just tearing it to shreds. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Good player. Uh, now I have well, a question. I don't know if he ever said that, but most others <laughs> did. Um, at what point do we start giving William Nylander credit for scoring in front of the net? None. No, was he no led point. the team in net front goals last season. No, no but but <laughs> but what? what national team does he play for? I can't, Sweden. Can't, uh, Sweden. can't do it. No. Can't do it. No player from Sweden has ever scored goals in front of the net. I have an honest, like a serious question here. This is a joke, would, by the way. Would anybody this think way. players from Sweden were soft if it wasn't for Don Jerry? Probably not. I don't like, know. Where That's did that come question. from? Because here's the thing with, like, Swedes are known to be benevolent to each other, you know, with their universal health care, and they're looking after each other. But the, um, the, the idea that Swedish players are soft is the only person I've ever heard that from in the media is Don Cherry. And when you look at the first Swedish players to play in the NHL, and I'm thinking specifically Boris Salming, not soft. Tough well, they were just hell. targeted. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you grow up in, like, literally the frozen north. Like, we think we got winters. Stockholm's no. like, no, like, exactly. Stockholm's like, oh, it's, it's bright till midnight out, up here. Like, it's, it's, they're way further. Or dark in the afternoon. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm very sort of surprised that, that they get stuck with that still. And Willie doesn't throw a bunch of hits, uh, but he doesn't need to. He's got he the is puck. a brick shithouse, though. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. He's strong. Hard to, He's... hard to knock off the puck. Oh, yeah. I think Don Cherry definitely was the like flag bearer of national xenophobia within hockey. You know, like I think he towards really Sweden. No, I like, think I think towards any European, really, over the last over the what was he on TV for thirty five years, years forty years? Yeah, I think, you know, when you're on TV, national TV in Canada for forty years, and you keep saying the same points over and over again for forty years, and one of those points is I don't like European hockey players. I think it's gonna get into this uh, the game a little, and I think it definitely did, and it created these terrible narratives. And the ones who were tough, he called rats, you know, yeah. like a, a guy like Casparitis, who was kind of a cheap shot artist, but you, you know, you know well, what I mean? And, but, but so was, so were Darcy Tucker and Ty Domi and we love them. Exactly. Uh, right? And were, we loved having them on the team. So absolutely. And, and a guy, a guy like Don Cherry, I, I think has sort of put at the forefront. Well, one, because he was on a national broadcaster, but two, because he lasted so long, but I, there's this footage that I can't for the life of me find, but I saw it once. I saw it with my own eyes. And it was Harold Ballard talking about a player on his own team. It was a, I want to say it was a Czech player. I want to say it was Peter and a Czech. Um, and someone asked him a In question name. about him. It sure was. And someone asked him a question about him point blank. And he says into the camera, he goes, eh, he's a dumb Czech. Uh, into the camera. I couldn't believe it. He I, is, so, have, well, if you yeah. look up any Harold Ballard interviews from the CBC archives, which, by the way, are available for free online, oh. um, like there was one with a woman, uh, woman host. Oh, yeah. And, and she has him and somebody else on at, on her show. And he says to the other man on the show, can somebody shut this woman up? Harold Ballard. I have not was, seen this. Ob, it's not a seeable. It's a listen. You, it wasn't filmed. Uh -oh. It was he was on the phone. Harold Ballard was the worst. He was terrible. terrible. I uh I remember I did a project on him like in elementary school. It was like grade three or four. I was, and the book that I took out from the library obviously had information that was over my head at that age. And I remember having to ask my parents, like why <laughs> there was a quote in there. He called someone, a, he called him a bunch of frogs. And I'm like, what does this mean? 
Like I don't, yeah, I've watched Bugs Bunny. I don't understand this insult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They oh. had to explain it to me. Yeah. And I, wanted to say something. I don't think the entire blame is on Don Cherry. Cause I, I would assume like people like Ballard and the company he would keep around him would perpetuate those stereotypes as well. Like, I don't think anybody was standing around arguing with Cherry about Europeans. I think there was a lot of people probably who agreed with him during those times, during those 40 well, years, mm, you know, McLean would game. argue with him and then people would yeah. call him stuff. Right. And then there's the whole uh, <laughs> cavalry of defense who are like yelling at Ron and being like, shut up, let Don talk. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. I guess. Well, I, guess. I remember I remember cuz my parents worked at the CBC and sold hockey night in Canada. My dad and stepmom. Um and like you sales know, team. Yeah, and they would have to deal with clients like like French Canadian clients calling and going, "He can't say this." <laughs> like, oh wow. <laughs> And he like he was hard on Canadians. Like it was it was like um he's like all oh, these remember the Frenchies with the visors thing that blew up and was like mm-hmm. especially big in Quebec. That um, was that was really not long ago. ago. It was not long ago. It wasn't. I mean, I was a kid, but it wasn't long ago. And I think so. The reason I asked that question is because you know I can understand a cabal of people at the top of hockey maybe thinking that or whatever. Um, and that was also part and parcel of the fact that the Europeans played a much more finesse oriented game, especially the Russians. It wasn't about the hits. It was about skating and shooting and scoring. And, um, and for some reason, he's the only guy I can actually point to that was saying that publicly at the time. Although my context isn't great because I wasn't alive for a lot of it. So I wonder if that was just something where the average person thought that too, which is weird. It's a very odd thing to think and a very ignorant thing to think, frankly. There, there are legitimate criticisms of William Nylander, but I, but I can't help but think how much easier of a time he'd have if his name was Mark Shifley. <laughs> What's the difference? Other than, I mean, Mark's a center. Mark scores a lot. Uh, of points. One's better at defense, and it's, it's Willie. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> dude, like, who's been benched this season more? Shife. <laughs> I mean, Willie was almost scratched, and wasn't yeah. just because of the injury, but, but. And he but was benched I, for a play. He was benched for a uh, a period. What if his name was Blake Wheeler? Yeah, you know. I think, and I'm not yeah. picking on the Jets. It's just those two are bad at defense. But yeah. what if what if we just change the expectations on players? It's the it's the line A thing. I think William William Wheeler suffers from the same thing that line A is facing right now. It's hey, this guy's a great goal scorer. Let him go be that. Don't expect the defense from because you need all of these different parts in, on a hockey team to win games and to be a Stanley Cup champion. What if William Nylander is not the guy you have chasing back on every back check? What if he's the guy on his line you get the puck to because he's going to shoot it and score? And he's going to play. Yeah, but then he does. Net. He does those things you just yeah, mentioned so, and doesn't and get the, credit but, for it. But then he also does the back checking stuff and he does play in the corners yeah. and he doesn't get credit. But you can also just like not expect those things if that's not the type of player he is and don't criticize him for that. And then when he mm-hmm. does it, it's even higher than what you expected. I think also this team, we've just, since they were introduced to the NHL, we've thought they were older than they are. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. I forget all the time. I forget all the time. And, you know, like I think, I think about Austin Matthews, who's, is he 23 or 24? Uh, Three, I want to say. 23. Mm -hmm. So I think about, I mean, there's lots of 23 year olds in the NHL and Mm -hmm. have been in the NHL. But then I think about myself at 23. What a shithead. (laughs) What a dumbass. And this dude is, is, I mean, he's playing as grown up as he's ever played. Yep. You know what I mean? And so is Willie. And so is Mitch. And so is Dermot, you know, to to go to, you know, a little further down the lineup. Is that because they're growing up? Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Isn't that amazing? Crazy. Yeah. I think that, that happens happen. to most people is happening to them. <laughs> like the window for this team is still so far open. Your your point about them being younger than we think, it's so true. Like they've been mm-hmm. Austin Matthews been in the league. This is what fifth year. He he got out of his entry level deal last season. Last season was the first like, year not in on his entry level contract. 
Yeah. Like that's that's insane. We think like, oh, these guys have been around forever. They should have won by now. And no, this is no. a core that just they're they're just getting into where they're peaking now. Like they're, this team has finally come together. Like last season, it wasn't there. They were eighth seed and they didn't make the playoffs. So they didn't make the Stanley Cup playoffs. And now we're seeing it come together. So it might take even like not even this season it might take a couple more years for them to actually get to their highest of talent levels. And it's going to be fun when, to watch. We got to keep remembering. Yeah, yeah. Win, win a damn round. round is what win I a damn say. round. <laughs> but and also, let me just throw this out there: old man or Morgan Riley, who's been around forever, is like twenty eight. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> uh, I don't even know if he's. A, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Like, that's it, right? That's it. I'm surprised he's even that old. Riley's twenty seven. Twenty seven. Wow. Has okay. has Morgan wow. Riley been eligible for free agency yet? No. Unrestricted. Uh, Unrestricted. After next season. I think after, after next. next season. And he signed his restricted deal, I think, with... D- didn't he sign it with a year... No, maybe he didn't sign it with a year left, mm-hmm. but they signed it before he went even to restricted free agency. And, and that's the and old Nas, guy. <laughs> yeah. Him and Nas yeah. signed deals the same day, and it's some of the tidiest contract work, honest to goodness, this team has ever done. I think that ever. was that was Lou. Mm-hmm. Uh, was Lou I, think, I think it was... It, and it was, them, it was coming off the year where they finished last... I'm pretty sure he got, I think he got Mo and Nas for six years each. Yeah. And at a total of $8.5 million. Morgan Riley signing like date of his current contract is April 13th, 2016. Six years, $30 million. Unbelievable. A beautiful birthday present. Six wow. times five. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. And he's pretty got great. a 72 point season in there. That's is a tidy bit of work. Yeah. I miss um, Nas, but it's a tidy bit of work. I, I got a question, guys. Do Montreal, does the Montreal Canadiens franchise, do the players, do they want to go to the playoffs? <laughs> uh, you know what? It's been a hard I, year. Yeah, I felt bad for them last night. This is one of the first times I legitimately felt bad for a Leafs opponent. Now, I know you lose Drew Ant, and that's tough. I get that. So that, of course, you know, you know, him taking his personal leave. And by the way, we wish him all the best with that. Hope he's okay. Of course. Uh, Coach was fired earlier in the year. Right, Coach for, you know, with a winning record, yeah. Coach is fired. Carey with Price has been right. out forever. Price is out. Gallagher is out. Mm-hmm. Byron was not in this game. Tatar was not in this game. Joanne was not in this game. Caulfield is a child. Like, yeah, I feel Romanov, that. in a way, like is still a child. Like he he's yeah. getting a little bit of the 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 treatment that the guys that we just talked about are getting. Like he, oh yeah, he's, him and Caulfield, the saviors of this. What you're not supposed to. It's great to have those young players. You're not supposed to lean all your weight on them. Mm-hmm. It's and is, and is Gallagher going to be back? Days, I before the playoffs, I think so. Okay, but like how how back is he going to be? Right. Well, he fucking sucks to play against. <laughs> I'm a no. big Brandon Gallagher fan. <laughs> I was wondering where that sentence was going. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> he doesn't though. No, he doesn't. I'm He's sure great. He doesn't. Man, I would He's love it if he was a Leaf. I love him. Oh. Uh, He's so great. I just you know, I think. You know, because obviously we're pretty sure that this is what's going to be the first round matchup. I realize Calgary's within quote unquote striking distance, five points. There's eight games left to play. We'll see. But uh, man, if if you go into the playoffs cold, it can be a pretty tough go. And we've hey, seen that. Ten points in my last seven games. Who am I? Uh, you are uh, John Tavares. No, William Nylander. Sam Bennett. Nice. Weird. Kill oh, that's why I Panthers. keep getting Sam Bennett tweets. People are like, "Oh, should have picked up Sam Bennett." He's had oh, oh, I'm sorry. He's had great a great seven games. <laughs> Adam, you <laughs> are for him. you Adam. No one in the history of the earth has ever been more anti Sam Bennett than you were. I'm not anti Sam <laughs> Bennett. I'm anti giving up a first round pick for Sam Bennett. Oh, hey, hey, Which is what they were asking. He oh. wants out. Trade him. Trade Adam. him. You're Wait, salty. He was traded, wasn't he? <laughs> You're salty. Hydrate. <laughs> Hydrate. Look at this. Uh, Bublé. Wait a second. Was he traded? To the Panthers. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. For like a second and a third or a third? It wasn't. So does that reflect poorly? Hold on. Does that reflect poorly on me or the Flames? Oh. Both. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just just because the Flames made a bad call doesn't mean you also didn't. It's Adam. It's not seven only, games, guys. What the not hell is only this? were you wrong about Sam Bennett, but you're not even the heir to Boston Pizza. Is he? So now what? 
So who's the heir to Boston what? Pizza? Isn't Brad Sam for Bennett. living the heir to Boston Pizza? Oh, Is he? Well, he's not the heir. He's just his brother. Jim? No, I think it's his dad. J- no, they, they Jim and Brad are brothers. Are they? I thought yeah. it was his dad. No, they're like they're both like fifty, aren't they? Oh, I don't know. I didn't know that. I thought it was his dad. I don't know what's happening. Oh, here. Jim Trilliving is older than fifty. Jim Trilliving is seventy nine. Oh, his child is Brad. Eat shit. Oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> Brad is fifty. I I could have sworn Jim Trilliving was like fifty five. You know what his secret is? Boston pizza. <laughs> Uh, by the way, Americans are like, what's Boston pizza? And is it from Boston? No, it's from no. Canada. It's a Canadian no. chain. Do they not have Boston pizza in the States? I don't, I don't believe so. What the? F- yeah, I'm going to go. world Google. doesn't make are sense. There, are there Boston pizzas in the <laughs> that's U.S.? Like, that's like a Burlington fish and chips just randomly in Connecticut or something like that. Like that oh, no, make- they do. They do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they got them in Mexico, too. But up until a few years Boston ago, they didn't. Boston pizza. But there are no Boston pizzas in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Massachusetts? There's nothing. There's no Boston pizzas in the actual state that Boston is in. That's there are 435 uh, Boston Holy pizzas in North America. Smokes. What are you <laughs> doing? Why are you GMing the flames, man? I, go huck some pizza. And yeah, and just go live off your dad's money. <laughs> what, are you, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Like you gotta, <laughs> Brad Trilliving needs to put up with my bullshit, criticizing him like he needs a hole in the head. Are you kidding me? Imagine being the GM of the Flames as a hobby. I that's what he is. Like good for him though. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty accomplished. That's like so it's pretty funny. amazing. We, we gotta hobby. keep the kids from getting up to mischief. Hey, son, go be an NHL executive. Make something of yourself. Wow. Okay. So in 20, 2012, where, the last where, reported where revenue of Boston Pizza on the Wikipedia page. Can you guess how much their revenue was in 2012? That's in 2012. Yes. That's I don't when know I was anything frequency. about money. I was so frequently say Boston pizza all the time. Then I, uh, go ahead, Steve. 720 your, million. 720? Okay. I'm gonna Adam? say I'm gonna say 5.2 billion. How <laughs> which is aka how much Rogers paid for the NHL rights. Wow. Okay. It wasn't that much, but in 2012, okay. Boston Pizza had a revenue of nine hundred and forty three million dollars but that's is it gross or net uh that's just it says revenue so, so revenue i gross. win price is right that uh steve wins yes i'm in the showcase showdown let's go not, your company is put, pulling in a billion dollars why are you gming the flames you know it's a billion dollars eight years ago imagine what they're doing now right a lot more probably yeah. yeah anyways so yeah sam ben is good he is good. <laughs> Man, my argument was never Sam Bennett isn't good. It's the Leafs don't need him. I think it was I don't that he's bad. Yeah, I thought you called, I thought you said he sucked. He was a bit of a perennial underperformer. I think everybody can agree with me on that one. He was. Am I wrong? Was he a fifth overall pick? I tell you what, he's KFC over a point a game in Adam, Florida. Are we at KFC because Adam's doubling down? Am I a sp- Aye, oh, um, hey, all right. Oh. Another another thing I want to say. So this is what I wanted to say on the Oilers, guys. Jets have lost five straight. Three of five of those have come against their likely first round opponent, opponent the Oilers. Um, nobody wants to play the Oilers when the Oilers are hot, right? We're agreeing on that. And they are red hot. That's a top red hot ten team in the league when they're on fire. If we're if we're just going by recent trends. Uh, the Leafs will play Montreal and beat them. Mm-hmm. And Edmonton will play Winnipeg and d- d- demolish them. D- it, like, they will beat... The, the Oilers will beat the Jets as it looks right now. Mm-hmm. The Oilers will beat the Jets by more than the Leafs will beat whoever their prospective opponent is. Oh, yeah. They just don't the match Oilers up. Are going yeah, their number. Though. Yeah. yeah. Right now, it looks like an inevitable collision of Matthews and McDavid in Canada. What an incredible matchup! Oh, so good, so good. Oh, oh! I and? can think of a few people I know who are like, "Come on, let's go!" Yeah, are they, are they all in the Rogers first employees? <laughs> yeah, they are all Rogers. I didn't employees. say that, Jesse Blake. Don't put words in my mouth. 
It is dangerous. The Blue Jays are going, please do it so we can sign more free agents this winter. I, fo- I follow this. Uh, he's, he's like a media specialty guy, Adam Seaborn. He's like, oh, this, this is one of the rare nights where Rogers probably wishes they didn't have Leafs Habs as their highlight because George Springer is making his Blue Jays debut. And then they were down 8 nothing after the third. Yeah, he's he like, went well, 0 for 4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean. Listen, good theory. Good Not all theory. good theories, are, you know, end up that way. Stop. I am very about baseball excited. Is it's always on the next night anyway. Yeah. Sorry, Jesse, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm very excited for Oilers Leafs. Like, I, th- I think that's what's going to happen. The scenario you played out there, Steve, that looks like it's going to happen. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to guarantee it. And I think the Leafs are going to take that matchup because of what we've seen so far in the regular season where they've kind of had the Oilers number, especially when they should my concern. My concern with that is playoff Mike around. Smith. Uh, my concern <laughs> with that is getting past the first round. Well, yeah. Uh, I won't believe they can do it until they do. Yeah. So the I mean? decimated there's, Habs? Like you're scared of that? No, 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 I'm not Jesse, scared of don't it. Don't put anything by it. Oh, yeah, Jesse, Leafs. I am not scared of the Habs. I am scared of the Leafs. You see, that, but that's the, unreasonable. I don't believe in unreasonable. It absolutely thing. is not. All right, here we go. Absolutely is not. <laughs> ding, ding, let's go. And Find absolutely, it out. Jesse, they haven't done it since 2004. Uh, Everyone was like, My- Michael Jordan, he can, he can do it. He can, until he freaking did it, <laughs> he could not prove that he you, could do it. Why are you comparing the Leafs to Michael Jordan? Because we compare everything in hockey to Michael Jordan for some reason now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. how it works. Yeah. That's how it works. No, but listen, <laughs> they should there's no reason to believe that they should lose to whoever their first round opponent is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I will not sleep eight hours consecutively until they do. (laughs) There are, is that fair Two. there are two very mediocre teams fighting for that last spot. I, Vancouver. Some would argue three mediocre teams. uh, Are we ruling out Vancouver or Calgary right now? Because one of them's still in it, I guess. Cal- I I I ruled that Vancouver. I'm ruling really out. Yeah, really especially because they lost last they night. Lo- yeah, had they not lost, remember it was the Durant tweet. Oh, if they win four in a row, yeah. they'll have a forty-two percent chance. And it's I like, think, I think it was no. tongue in cheek from Drancer. Yeah, of um, course, of course. But, but yeah. since their little miracle back to back against the Leafs, they have not looked good because they're not very good. I think the Leafs will handle Calgary or Montreal. It looks like it's going to be Montreal with like five less bodies than they should have. So I'm not concerned. Come on, guys. Have some faith in your team. Yeah, I, I, I do really think they would beat Montreal, but do it. <laughs> do it first. <laughs> yeah. Please do it. They play the games for a reason. Mm-hmm. 100%. percent hmm Uh, So we'll see what happens with that. It's going to be very, very interesting. Now, I want to mention a couple of things here. Uh, First off, a little shout out to the NWHL. They have doubled their salary cap going into next season. It was $150,000 per team. It will now be $300,000 per team. Uh, So that's really interesting. And there's an article in a story right now at sportsnet.ca talking about how um, they are willing to uh, open to, and I think they've already, you know, when we had... um, Danny Ryland, the former commissioner on open to many defenses with the PWHPA um, and have remained. So I don't know if that feeling is reciprocated for the PWHPA, but I wouldn't want to speak for them. However, that's pretty attractive. Uh, if you're a professional hockey player, you know, salary caps doubling and be, you know, that, that might be a game changer in this deadlock. And yep. Jana Hefford tweeted her, her praise of it uh, mm-hmm. and her affiliation with the PWHPA is no- noteworthy. Uh, in this case, also on the NWHL front, uh, Toronto Sixes uh, star player Michaela Grant Mentis was named League MVP. That's all round of applause for her. A number thirteen as Toronto's best player. Never seen it before. Never, never, not once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, not once. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Jesus, Steve. We were hoping it would be the guy over Jesse's shoulder, but he never showed up. That's true. Steve Very Nash. Good. Now, let's never talk about, um, by the way, one. the other thing that's hanging up there, I got that for Jesse. So I'm glad he still has it. Did yeah, you? Yeah. I like my Toronto yes. a retina shirt. Where, where, when, how long ago? It was a while ago. Is that a baseball shirt? 
Yeah, it's like a baseball tee, kind of. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's for the summer. Arena. It's got meshing stuff. It's nice. I like cool. it. Cool. Good for you. Mm. Yeah. I don't got it for me. Uh, for is it big birthday. enough for you, Jesse? Place. Yeah, it like, still it, fits. Yeah, it if it's like a, if it's like a nice summer day, it's like a uh, breezy tea. You know, it sounds like a drink <laughs> that I would drink at the park if it were legal in Toronto, which apparently it won't be, but people will do it anyway. No. Um, I want to read this story that Elliot Friedman gave to Thirty One Thoughts. Uh, this and this is talking about the uh, the rights fees um, and the switch over from you know. Uh, one broadcasting network to the other. So um, uh, basically um, he said when I, when CBC was negotiating to keep the rights prior to the 14, 15 season, we were told, and Elliot, you have to remember 31 thoughts was a CBC column and Elliot was a CBC personality. Is that how old 31 thoughts is? Oh yeah. I remember being on this show and you saying like, when we first started, I said, who should, what do I need to read each week? to get a little bit more educated and, and to make sure I'm up on things and stuff. And the first thing you said was 31 thoughts and you said it's 30. cbc.ca. 30. 30 thoughts. 30, 30 thoughts, yeah. right? And next year it'll yes. be 32, 32. 32 thoughts. Yeah. Because 30 thoughts. Right. Like that. Yeah. And nice. really it's like 38 thoughts, uh, but you know, you can't pare it down. It's, it's too a much full, Elliot information. Full column followed by 31 thoughts. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, Elliot talking about the rights deal when, when Rogers came in and made their big push. So uh, when CBC was negotiating to keep the rights prior to the 2014-15 season, CBC was told they would have to pay more for a lesser package than the one they'd already had. Ultimately, the massive Rogers bid changed everything, but CBC wasn't crazy about the idea. And the CBC, if you don't know, is a publicly funded broadcaster in Canada, not unlike PBS, but a lot more like, say, BBC. Right. And, you know, PBS is, is privately funded by the public, whereas the public publicly funds it here. It's government funded broadcaster. And um, anyway, long story short, um, uh, it was very interesting. He said, the euphoria of winning a bidding war. He said, I live both of the both sides of this. The euphoria of winning a bidding war, knowing a fresh, exciting property is coming to your network and the crushing disappointment of losing something that is, quote, yours, something you've poured your heart into and the uncertainty of it and that what that creates. Um, he's talking about, you know, NBC because NBC has a lot of great people doing hockey every single day. And, you know, I bet a lot of those people just end up at ESPN or TNT because they're already great. Like they already have a profile in the sport. Why not? But it's also very scary. And this is what he had to say. They don't know that. Yeah. I remember the day CBC lost the rights. So listening good. to the company conference call from the hospital where our family was going through a rough time. So imagine eh? it absolutely sucked. Other than that, I have almost no memories of that season. I was in a fog and didn't snap out of it for months until Mike Babcock, then in Detroit, asked how I was handling the transition and hearing the answer said I had to snap out of it because, quote, your family is depending on you. When I was hired by Sportsnet, they told me I had a really strong year uh, after we knew we lost the rights. Honestly, I don't remember, but I've used that as something that could help others. Even if your brain is mush, you've still got to grind. The right people are always watching. And if you shine in challenging times, they're going to notice. And I thought that was pretty cool. He, I, man, that was, uh, I, I was at CBC when it was first reported and I could have cried. I could have cried because that the, the, they were already losing so much money. Mm -hmm. and so many people were getting laid off and it was it was miserable like frank the, to be frank it was everyone there was because miserable. because the government in power at the time too was under was on purposely defunding it um because that was, was part that of harper mandate. yeah that was Back a then? conservative minority government yeah yeah and uh it, no it was heartbreaking and then you know, like news, news trickles out about what their, what their plans are. And, you know, I, I was, you know, writing highlight packs at the time and, you know, I, I wasn't top priority. And then, you, you know, the, the hires start trickling out and, oh, this guy got hired by Sportsnet, this person and, and someone from CBC who I was given the impression did not like me was given up like a managerial role. And Whoa. that was another one where I was like, oh my God, I'm going to cry. Like, I, like, so I'm never getting in there then. So there's nowhere to work. So I got to go to, I got to go to TSN or bust. 
I go to, I got to go to TSN or I'm not going to get in anywhere. And I had two meetings with the VP of TSN, 20 minute meetings. And he's like, if I could hire you right now, I would, but it's, it's not up to me. Uh, I don't, I don't remember if I put these things specifically in the book. Not that one, but you, I, you did put the, the sports net, um, the Sportsnet interview, the original one in the book. Oh, the original one where I didn't get in the worst job interview in my entire life. <laughs> uh, and and let me, I had some pretty bad ones. Well, What's to be that fair, that called? guy's gone and probably for a good reason. It's called, I'm glad you asked, Jesse. It's called, uh, this team is ruining my life, but I love them. How I became a professional hockey fan, Steve Tangle Glenn. This is an advanced reading copy. If you want one with more spelling mistakes than the other ones in stores, you can get this one right here. Um, no. So, but then I ended up getting hired by that guy or working under that guy, you know? So can't believe everything you hear, even the things about yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> is what I learned, but it was uh, an extraordinarily challenging time. And so the, the reason I jumped in and said, you know, those employees at NBC who are, will probably go on to work at ESPN or TNT. Here's hoping. They, they oh, yeah. yes, but they don't know that. Right. Yeah. So when I was at CBC, uh, I did not know that. I didn't know that I'd be getting a call. I got a call like less than a month before the season was supposed to begin in 1415, um, asking me to work at Rogers. Cause you, I remember, um, I remember that because we were talking about it on the show and like, it's like, well, do I have to work with the KHL again? Like, so I can work the entire season and they yeah. might pay me. Maybe. We just started the podcast. You got me that tech savvy deal, Adam. And right. I don't know what we would have done. I don't know what we would have done if I never got that tech savvy deal because the day after our wedding, Hey, thank God for the Italian side. Hey, the booster. Uh, but, but the day after the wedding, before we went to the bank to deposit the money we got from the wedding, um, we had $900 to our name. You know, it, we had, uh, we had, we had like a mortgage payment and I don't know, maybe a couple big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> to our name, uh, basically. And had you not helped get me that tech savvy deal? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, to be fair, you got you that tech savvy deal. I just negotiated the price, but I'm glad. That I wasn't going to ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that it worked out, but you know, it's, it's crazy. You know, it, it's funny when I think about time, back then, how close run some things were like, you know, Steve oh. could have at any point got a job as like a reporter and then, he, you know, be on the road and we wouldn't have been able to continue the podcast or, you know, like there's a bunch of things that could have happened that would have conspired against this show happening. I almost went to Jesse, Russia. Jesse never applying at KISS. Um, and like if Jesse hadn't sent in his resume and impressed the hell out of my boss, Karen, who, by the way, is my still still my boss, Karen, um, he would have never been an intern and then never been a producer and then never been brought in when Chris left, the original producer on this show. And we wouldn't be here. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. It was like, you know, the edge of a knife on like you're, you're kind of walking on to yeah. get to this point. We're lucky, lucky to be here. And so anybody that's going through that right now, uh, our hearts go out to you. It's really, really tough when those things switch. And um, I have to say, NBC did a really great job. Um, and it was funny to hear the American perspective on hockey and the way it was broadcast. Like Sarah Sivian of The Athletic was tweeting that, you know, when she's when she watches Canadian feeds, it feels like an event. And I'm like, fuck, when I watch American feeds, it feels like an event. Canadian, I'm like, <laughs> we need to. And I think it's because when I watch American feeds for anything, it's, it's not hockey. It's basketball and football, which are my two favorite other sports other than like motor racing. So um, football, it's like, it's going to be every, every game feels like it's the last game to ever get played. And I feel like hockey needs to get to that. And I hope ESPN and TNT are able to turn it into that uh, because it would be really great to elevate just the energy surrounding what is an extremely energetic and competitive and amazing game. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'm excited to see in regards to uh, the coverage that you mentioned there, Adam, just the American coverage, the way they do football, it's like the pregame for football can start at like 9 a.m. here on the East Coast. Like you can turn like on the TV things. and you'll see like the pre pregame show of the ESPN <laughs> coverage of Sunday football. And it'll start at like nine and then it goes from like nine to 11 and at 11, you get the pre of the pregame show. And then at noon, you get the pregame show and then you get the games at one. And yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm excited to see the NHL coverage in the, the 
the sh- shows around the games because they do such a great job with that stuff like the jump that they've created around basketball that you wake up to every morning there's just a basketball morning show on so i'm excited oh. what espn or tnt creates around hockey like if you get to be ES- sick to do a hockey morning show yeah that's I what would they have just Ho- die I hopefully would they die. create something like that that's what i'm excited die and go to heaven yeah oh yeah. it's i love the buzz of those days yeah, the, yeah. the trade deadline like i just i just i love the buzz mm-hmm. even something as dumb as <laughs> you, you know what i'm glad to say like okay i did one i did one at least i did one when i was working for the steelheads and i got to be on the ice for a teddy bear toss <laughs> like that fun no because the whole day like as the staff working that game you're waiting for the first goal when's it coming when's it coming and then it comes in ah thousands of teddy bears and it takes forever to clean up mm-hmm. they drive trucks onto the ice i start smelling gas i'm like what oh they're driving trucks onto the ice thank god because this would take an eternity otherwise I love the buzz. They got to create a buzz. Yeah, we love do. We, we need to do a better job of that. I guess the States do too. Hockey needs a buzz around it. And Jesse, it's so funny that you mentioned that there are rounds of panels. Mm-hmm. Each at each two or three hour block has a new round, but there's the main panel. They always go back to at least once an hour who are going to take it to the pregame show later on that afternoon. But I love like they'll, they'll bring in some color. They'll be like Frank Caliendo will come in and do a bunch of impressions of Shaq and it'll make you laugh and stuff like that. And they, they sprint, they, they do great player features and things like that. I don't know. I would just be nice. Imagine there was a buildup of all day. Like we do hockey day in Canada one day a year. It's what like a weekly trade? trade deadline. Yeah. That's, I don't know. I think that would be fantastic. I just don't know if the economics support it, frankly, you know, like right. in the States, there's a lot more people, a lot more money. Yeah, so, are you going to get the ratings if you air a hockey show in the middle of the afternoon, you know? Yeah, I just oh. don't know that the money's there. We'll see. Just don't Hopefully. know. Yeah. Um, now, if we keep going here, I, I do want to mention a couple of things from uh, uh, from Elliot Three, Friedman's 31 Thoughts. We'll, we'll stay super quick on these ones because there's one major thing that Jesse requested we get to, and we will. Uh, the Rod Brindamore extension talks. Um, mm-hmm. Elliot wrote... Point number eight and 31 thoughts. For a while now, teams have indicated that they'd like to rein in coaching slash friend office salaries. Of course they would because they're cheap. And we're going to get an indication of how serious that really is over the next little while. Carolina's Tom Dundon is one owner who's mentioned it publicly, and the Hurricanes are working on an extension with Brenda Moore, who sets the tone for a really good team. A month ago, I heard it was a foregone conclusion, but then was warned it was tougher say a tougher grind than anybody could have hoped or wanted. I, be- I don't believe Brenda Moore wants to go anywhere. I have always believed this gets done, but it's been a challenge. I don't think you're reining in coach, good coaches. I think they're going to make what they're going to make. It's they, just you money. can't reverse that. It's just money. Like, like to, if Tom Dundon somehow listens to this, think of the stupid shit you have spent money on in your career. You could spend it on such so much dumber things than Rod Brindamore. He's at least a top 10 coach in this league. Probably top five. Like he's fantastic. Look what he's done with the Hurricanes. No one would be shocked to see them win at all. Mm-hmm. Give him his money. It costs you money. That's it. And look at what happens to teams when really good coaches walk away. Washington. Oh, I. Well, I mean, they're still good. They are. But have but, they been the same? No. 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 I bet. I'm willing to bet they wish they gave Barry Trust the money. Yeah, because you got to look at how much did it cost me. It's just round of the playoffs would have paid Barry Trotz's salary for the entire next season. One round, one extra round. What about this uh, American TV money coming in? Yeah. You know, you, you, t- you talk about the salary cap and all oh, we can do this. It's just money. Well, how much money did, didn't Tom Dundon get go in on? Was it arena football or the, the XFL? XFL? Was it the XFL. XFL? And he lost money on that, like a hundred million bucks or something yeah. like that, or pulled his money or there was something. And for a fraction of that, you can have Rod Brindamore forever. Take that. <laughs> Travis Green yeah. is also up in Vancouver, and there's talk that he wants to get that done, and they want to get that done, which is good. I think he's a good fit there. Don't cheap out on the one non-salary cap signing you're going to make this year. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Flowers are blooming, the grass is growing, and it's time to chop the weeds. Thanks to our sponsor, Manscaped, you can trim your holes safely and efficiently. I am talking about ball trimmers. Manscaped. 
The global leaders in men below the waist grooming have an exclusive offer for our audience. Use the code SDP to get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Join the other 2 million men who trust Manscaped. They are here to make sure that you are trimmed and smelling nice. After all, it's time for that spring cleaning. Now, Manscaped, as you know, global leaders in below the waist grooming. And we're talking about uh, things like the crop preserver. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. Very important if you're someone like me and you run hot and it's getting into the hot season. And as you know, things can happen. They get stuck places you don't want them to get stuck is what I'm trying to say. The crop preserver preserves the crop. Uh, you'll also like the crop reviver. It's a toner for that area, which will keep you smelling fresh, just like spring flowers. Now, we want you to smell good this spring. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SDP at manscaped.com. Do yourself a favor. Use the right tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SDP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code SDP at manscaped.com. It's spring cleaning, baby, and your balls will thank you. I thought this was interesting. If you're just a Leaf fan or if you're a Blue Jackets fan, you probably already know this. But uh, point number 11, text from one exec after Nick Foligno's first two games in Toronto. The quote is, have you noticed anything unusual he does? Elliot said, I hadn't. He pointed out that Felino switches hands on the penalty kill to maximize reach in passing lanes. That's a good one. Uh, and the executive wrote, good to see you're paying attention to the games that you work. Switches, <laughs> switches hands switches hands in terms of stick? I think he switches like, sides. I'm going to look out for it now. He Wait, grabs like he a different stick. I think that's what he's saying. The, no. Mm, is he not, I what, think what he's saying, saying is, is he... Oh, okay, he just, okay, so he's a lefty. So you would think he reaches with his right. So he might take his left-handed stick with his right hand and swing around. Like kind of like how Tyson Berry would receive okay. uh passes. He would he would change handedness and receive the puck on his backhand. Is that right. what he, now I'm right, gonna look right, for right, it? Right. I'm gonna look for it. I don't know. I didn't I was hoping that you guys could tell me because that's what I think we as. would notice if Nick Felino randomly had a right-handed <laughs> stick. That's why I'm freaking out. <laughs> like, <Man>. Surely <laughs> I think we would have noticed you, that. <laughs> sorry, you're asking us to notice my new my new details. Come on now. Uh, that's not what we specialize in. It's gross generalizations and hot takes on this show. Are you kidding <laughs> don't me? You dare, don't you dare tug on my cape. Anyway. I, I I better notice that. Damn mm -hmm. it. I thought that was kind of cool. That's what it, it is. No matter what it is, it's still kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's surprising to me that that is something that's rare. Like rare enough that it's noteworthy. Right. I think probably players are too afraid to get burned on it. Yeah. If you're reaching well, for the like, puck with your opposite hand. Yeah. You want to intercept passes, but you also don't want to misplay the thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, huh. yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, okay. So um, definitely something to look for. Also, um, and this, is, this is something that I uh, Jesse requested we bring this up. Jake Paul versus Floyd Mayweather. Logan. <sighs> Logan Paul. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Not the Logan one Paul. who just had a boxing match <laughs> with uh, Ben Askren has been training for a long time. The other one who lost a boxing match to another YouTuber. Logan, yeah. who lost to KSI, will fight the greatest boxer of all time. June 6th, in the same place they play the Super Bowl, in that stadium in Miami, he's going to fight I think it's that stadium, he's going to fight the greatest boxer of all time, a YouTuber I think it's a Dude. wild thing that's happening in reality <laughs> I had a conversation with someone in person, so it was over a year ago mm -hmm. uh, about the Logan Paul KSI fight Okay, and I go, you need to be covering this because, you, okay, you don't know who either of these people are, I'm sure but here's Logan Paul's YouTube page all right. See those numbers. All right. Here's KSI's YouTube page. See those numbers. All right. Okay. They're going to play each other or they're, they're going to fight each other. And unless there's a significant game in a certain sport that day, I think it was in the summer. I, I go, this will be the biggest sporting event of the day. Mm -hmm. And the, they just looked at me like I was a Martian. And here we are <laughs> about a year and a half later. And Logan Paul is fighting Floyd Mayweather. The greatest boxer of all time is fighting the Paul brother who is least good at boxing. <laughs> Zero hyperbole. That's what's happening. Actually, in life. Mm -hmm. In like less than two months. Yep. June 6th. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's absolutely unbelievable. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous thing. And it's going to generate so much money. 
Like, mm. that's the thing. That's Both the of thing. these guys, uh, Jake, uh, on two Saturdays ago when he fought Ben Askren, he made in that one fight more money than any UFC fighter has made in their career in one match. Like, well, that's he because got, Dana, Dana White makes all the UFC fighters money. Right, but you'd think like, like Conor like McDavid. He, the salary's a little lower than that. you think Conor McGregor or um, like Chael Sonnen or Anderson Silva or just someone would have had a big payday bigger than freaking Jake Paul. But Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Man, and what a, what a <laughs> card. What a card uh, on the weekend. Just just what a, what a everything. Every match had something ridiculous happen in it. Oh, the UFC uh, card? Like, yes. Yeah. But this yeah. is literally a YouTuber with zero boxing wins mm-hmm. and like several inches and 30 pounds on Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> Different weight class. Completely Versus different. Floyd oh, yeah. Mayweather. Like, I don't even. Okay. That's another thing. How will this match get sanctioned they're, so they're not the same exhibition. size they're not close so they've they've deemed it an exhibition it's not a sanction like for the records boxing match it's just an exhibition between these two individuals and they're gonna box and they each have to stay within a particular weight um that, that's different from each other too so like so, the specifics are like well, I think was it Floyd's like one thirty and Jake's got to be like one fifty or within ten pounds of it or something like that. It's got to be they're both they both have different parameters that right. will allow this fight to happen. Right, they're not the within agreement. the same weight class. So yeah. this would not alter Mayweather's record no. if he were to lose. No, <laughs> but you know Which what I have won't, to say? But the the Paul brothers are really good at at this one thing, mm-hmm. and that's being the villain. They're really good at being the most hateable people. And hateable people have huge followings, as we've seen in politics. Hey. And, oh. and it's, it's, it's one of those things where they set themselves up each and every time to win, even if they lose. So if he loses this fight to Mayweather, well, you lost to Floyd Mayweather. Everybody expected that. You still walk away rich. If you beat Floyd Mayweather, which is, which is crazy to think about, too. But if he does, which is fake. then he's like, then... He beat Floyd Mayweather and he's still rich. Like there's no losing this because he's supposed to lose. So the worst he can do, the worst that can happen is, well, every, every, everything happened that we expected to happen. And this is what, what it's like when an average Joe steps into the ring with a real like certified killer with, you know, in terms of boxing, like just an unbelievable boxer. We get to see pros versus Joe's. That's what this 100%. is. Yeah. <laughs> Remember yeah. that old show from the score? Oh man, I used to yeah. watch that. Or Spike Ooh, TV or whatever. Was on that. Yeah. Yes, so good. Uh, guys like, um, uh, yeah, I think it was Claude Lemieux and there was a few like N- NBA and N- NFL players on that. But mm-hmm. anyway, long story short, I think the Paul brothers just set it up. They stack the deck in their favor each and every time because they've got the following to do so. And they cannot, people are like, oh, I just can't wait for them to get beat up. Guys, even if they did, it doesn't matter. They're they still going to win. There's yeah. because they don't step into any situation where they can't win. Jake Paul went to a UFC card with the intention of getting booed out of the building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, that's why he went there. He wasn't there like, oh, I want to see the fights. He was there to be seen and booed and get into an altercation with Daniel Cormier, <laughs> like one of the most decorated mixed martial artists of all time. And he interviewed Daniel like, Cormier. Calling him a dick. You did for what? Yeah, I interviewed Daniel Cormier for um, uh, Entertainment City, believe it or not. (laughs) No, like like, what was he promoting? I think he was promoting, it was your world this week, because we had, when I was working at Rogers, remember I worked for um, Channel One? Yeah. Which was the channel that was like, here's what's happening on the cable. This dish. <laughs> can we, we can had... we contact that for people? So yeah. So there's... The... <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. You there's, the movie there's guy. There's I'm interested to hear your perspective. There's on it. two major cable networks in Canada, especially well in Ontario specifically. Uh, yeah. Bell and Rogers. SDPN. <laughs> Rog- oh, sorry. three three major cable networks. Three. SDPN. <laughs> Visit SDPN.ca for all of your Steve Diego podcast merch. Uh, Rogers and Bell. And at, when you turn on a Rogers box, every time you turn it off, you turn it on, it turns to a Rogers channel. So like the default, uh, like the homepage of your cable box. And Adam used to be the running loop TV that ran on the default cable channel of the major cable network that is in Ontario. It's a wild Which, thing. As his friend, that. as his friend, 
weird. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> every time you turn on your cable box, I was there. There he is. Time. Just every time. Every time. <laughs> and it ran in a half an hour loop and we recorded it every week. So I did a bunch of interviews with like weird, like I would have never done these interviews, but a ton of sports interviews, a ton of sports interviews because of that. And Daniel Cormier was one of them. And he was awesome. Like such a nice guy, really uh, like you expect people to be, you know, win a sport like that to be intense, super relaxed. One of the most personable people I ever interviewed. And I remember actually, I did tell you guys I interviewed him because I didn't know much about UFC. And I walked in that day and then it came out on the podcast and you were guys who were like, what? No, that was, I think that was Chris Weidman. Who oh, was that was Chris Weidman. Yes. While yes, he sorry. was champion, like yes. fresh off of like a victory or two against Anderson Silva, like greatest mixed martial artist of all time at the time and you're like yeah i talked to chris wyman i'm like what <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah and i oh, held i, this, I held it. the belt that's ah! cool that's cool adam <laughs> oh back when the ufc belts were cool yeah it was pretty that must have been a really fun gig for the time being because like you got, they would have to give you the biggest anybody just to fill up the mm -hmm. time in that channel right yeah. Yeah. So they would come off and it was great because Dina, Dina at BT was so awesome. And Steve, I get you were on BT the other day with Sid Sixero, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Dina was so great because she could literally interview anyone. Like she ended up on world star once because she, uh, who was that with? Oh, a vibe was it cartel. Beanie Man? Beanie Man. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. I'm it was wrong. Beanie Man. Wrong it was Beanie Man. Uh, <laughs> and, and like her and Beanie Man, like started like freestyling together. And then she ended up on, on that uh, on world star and then like world star like complimented her on her freestyle skills which is wild so yeah. dina had this ability to just make people feel warm so by the time i got to interview them they were already in a good mood so all i had to do was come in and be friendly and ask a few questions and you know we would be clipping them so they'd be a 30 second or 40 second thing it wasn't that big of like a long interview um so i got to you know, interviews, interviews, interviews. I think I did three or four a day. And that was when you guys just make fun of me. It was like, I had four jobs. That's what it was. It was BT kiss and then this show and then this channel one gig. And so, yeah, I got to interview just things. I forget. Like I got to interview Spike Lee. That's like, cool. Crazy. Right. Yeah. Like this, ugh, your you know resume I mean? is, you know, and I got to interview like, you know, like mega death. And then I got to interview, um, Oh God, uh, Buster Rhymes at the Grammys and like st shit that you're like, remember designer? Mm -hmm. Panda, Panda. Yeah, 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 yeah. Him yeah. and his mom. I got to interview him and his mom. That's fun. And I ended up on, and I got on DJ Khaled's uh, uh, Snapchat at the 2016 Grammys. Like it was just stupid. Like I remember like afterwards I was like, oh, there I am. <laughs> Came in and, and he like put me on his Snapchat. Yeah, it was, it was just weird. Anyway, so I got really, really lucky with that gig. It was just kind of a, dumb luck thing that you fall into that man it was fun it was a really fun thing um anyway jake paul floyd mayweather that's gonna be fun to watch and i have to say uh nobody plays the the villain role better than the paul brothers those guys just know how to play it and they've got legions of fans and they're doing extremely well at being the bad guy um both of their so, main channels by the way uh are up over 20 million subscribers so it's ridiculous. So sorry, I was Steve trying to fight? find the Dina clip. Uh, sorry, what were we saying? Who should Steve fight? Oh, who wants it's, it? It's got to be the hockey guy. It's Is it the hockey guy? Steve oh. and the hockey guy in a boxing match. We put it on at the rec room in downtown Toronto. We get a, we get a ring in there and they fight. And then the loser and then has we to rig it. <laughs> no, we rig it to yeah. be made a draw so that we can have the rematch in Vancouver. <laughs> Like Logan from all KSI, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we have it has we to be rigged. It. Yeah. It has to be rigged. Yeah. It's important that it's rigged to the business model. It's very important. <laughs> Would you rather fight Coach the Shannon hockey guy go, or Coach Jeremy? Oh, no offense, Shannon, but I don't want to fight Coach Jeremy. Coach Jeremy's in really good shape. Remember when he he's came in, in really good shape? He's tall, athletic, played hockey his whole life. Yeah. No. Nasher? Can you can you fight Nash? You boxing match? He seems too friendly. What's up, gang? I'm about to beat this guy's ass for challenging me to a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be challenging Nasher, man. I don't know. Boomstick, Shan Boomstick, I call him for his now deceased Twitter name. He just he seems too calm. 
but maybe maybe he's like one of those guys who you know he's calm until you push him and then he brings the pain mm. Mm. Can only, only one way to find out <laughs> to fight him straight up fight him we call it a celebrity with a question mark hockey youtuber <laughs> oh no <laughs> wow <laughs> we can wow. Buy tickets. that's the match yeah is the, uh, the the two of you but you know what we should instead what we should do and it should be for charity is we should do it where it's mike tyson's punch out oh that's a good Where'd idea you? and nobody gets to be mike tyson because that's not fair oh the video game yeah I, in my head i was like oh i have to dress up like last joe no i got it we boxing oh. <gasps> oh, <laughs> we get we get a Wii and it, they yeah, yeah, boxed yeah. for the championship. Oh, oh. now we got to find two Nintendo Wii's that still work. Oh, we got uh, I, I had yeah. one once. I don't know what happened to it, but uh, oh. you ready to catch these digital hands? <laughs> <laughs> and the doo -doo 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 yeah. theme song. <laughs> did, did you guys just stand there like this and cheat and just move your wrists? Because the and I, remember, I have never cheated at video games my entire life. Because <laughs> the dumb the thing to do is actually move your arms. You know, it's just yeah, all about the no, wrist it's... action. Yeah, yeah. I may or may not have temporarily had a Wii and used my arms. I have a feeling that Steve was the kind of guy who lost control of his Wii controller and it went through the TV. <laughs> did did, yes, it, did you use lost the wrist control bands? of the? No, oh, I always had the wristbands. Mm -hmm. I would, I would play, I would play uh, Punch Out. Before it was Mike Tyson's punch out, it was just punch out. Uh, where it was Mr. Dream instead of Ooh. Mike Tyson. And I would play that and Tecmo World Wrestling until I had to tape my thumbs. Like, because I couldn't play through the blisters. I uh, I was a an absolute a lot killer at Mario Kart Wii. An absolute oh. killer. I hated racing Did games. you use killer. the steering wheel or just the controller? Steering wheel. Steering wheel guy, okay. It was the only thing I had in Halifax that was basically free to do because at that point you didn't have to pay to race other people online. So you'd see like the flags come up and like, and, and we, there was no headset, I don't believe, at least not when I was playing. So you couldn't talk to anybody. How would you? But I was just every game, people. W's, that's W's, all like it was number one, number one, number one, number one, because that's all I did. I was pouring in Halifax. Damn. You didn't yeah. have beer, most bars per capita. North yeah, America. well, I didn't have most money per capita. So <laughs> that, that was when I used to drink at home and have a beer at the bar and make it last as long as I could because I couldn't, I had to show up drunk. Basically. Really? You didn't quad fist like we did in Guelph? Well, that was, that was a dollar beers. Yeah, I could dollar or $2 shot it for a bit. But if I spent more than about 20 bucks at the bar, I was blowing budget for the week. Adam and I at last call one night, we've told the story a thousand times, I'm sure, but we got four beers at last call, two in each hand, and we pushed them together like Oktoberfest. <laughs> and that's how we held them. And this girl tried to crowd surf and it was unsuccessful because she was surrounded by men who had four beer in their hands. So we all so, got out of the way. So she just sort of she, fell through a table and like it was, WWE. And <laughs> it was a face plant like I've never seen before or since. I've, I've never, her hands didn't get out in front of her. So she a, should not have done that. She no. didn't ask us. We didn't know her. And it was an acoustic band too. It was like two guys. <laughs> it was just dumb. Like, what are you doing? How did, anyway, how she's did, probably how did like- here? I don't, I don't know. know. She's probably about. like a successful person now <laughs> who like, you know, married kids, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but one time. Anyway, uh, let's get into the press conference. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid. But, you know, we had to give it up because we realized it was full of sugar and junk that you really shouldn't eat. I've been trying to cut down on my carbs, sugar, unhealthy food. I can't eat all that stuff anymore. But with the new year and summer upon us, we're trying to eat a little bit better. Healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. And that's why you should check out Magic Spoon. It's got all the amazing flavors you love without all the bad stuff. We're talking about zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs for each serving. Only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly. It's gluten-free. It's grain-free. It's soy-free. It's low-carb, and it's GMO-free. Variety packs include four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. How do you not love that? 
Come on. So check out magicspoon.com slash SDP to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code SDP at checkout to save $5 off your first order. And Magic Spoon is confident in their product. So confident. In fact, it's backed by the 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, you get your delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash SDP and use the promo code SDP to save $5 off. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. Now, before Steve we get has, to Jesse asking oh, questions, uh, Stephen. Stephen. <laughs> I, I started talking and you started talking. My bad. Also, <laughs> oh, go ahead. It's clean. Headline from Sportsnet. Yarmir Yager at age 49 helped lead the team he owns back to the top division in the Czech Extra Liga. So it was him and I think Thomas Blacanitz, his teammates, playing in the Czech Tier 2 League. Like, well... I don't know if Kalkanitz is in his 40s, but Yager's almost 50, and now their team is going to get promoted to Tier 1. That's pretty cool. Cool for them. Good for for them. them. Did you hear Um, the other breaking news? Uh, Larry Tannenbaum is going to join the Raptors as their new point guard, and he's going to try to lead them to uh, the playoffs. That's very cool. you, You know, he felt inspired to do that when I drunkenly walked up to him and said he was doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, and he he saw Yager, and he said, "He said Yager, you know, you can do it. I can do it." Yeah, I'm you sure did a Larry, good job there. I'm sure Larry Tannenbaum really needed you to say that to him. He did. <laughs> he said, "Thanks, hey, Larry. Thanks, like, thanks." I mean, he just kept walking, and I'm lucky I didn't get punched by security. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, I'm gonna butcher your last name here. It's Worovski. 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 Matt. Anyway, it's Matt on Twitter tweeted this at me. He said, you made some great points a couple SDPs ago about a top about the top 16 teams making the playoffs. This is a hybrid proposal if you're interested. Love your thoughts and contributions on the podcast. Thank you, Matt. So do we want to go through Matt's proposal? Because I thought it'd be kind of fun and it's quite detailed. Are you guys into it? Hit me. Real quick. Jess, you into it? Okay. Yes. Yes. So here's how it starts. The 2018-19 Montreal Canadiens finished with 96 points, 14th overall in the NHL and 9th in the East. They weren't able to compete in the playoffs, even though they finished ahead of Dallas, Vegas, and Colorado, respectively. Kind of crazy when you think about it. Montreal, in this format, would play Colorado, second wildcard team, finishing 17th overall in a one-game elimination game. The winner keeps or takes over that wildcard slot in the divisional playoff bracket. You with me? Yes. This team, which is this is something the CFL did. They did a crossover. This team. Yeah, but there's sorry, this six. Keeps, <laughs> there's eight teams in the CFL. This keeps the integrity of both finishing in the top 16, Montreal, and eighth team in the conference, Colorado, to allow these teams to settle the score between themselves. The goal here is to have all 16 teams get a chance to compete in the Stanley Cup playoffs. This also works if multiple teams finish in the top 16. Uh, but out of the playoffs. For example, if two teams in the East are ranked 15th and 16th, while two teams in the West rank 17th and 18th, 15 would face 18 and 16 would face 17, similar to like, you know, the one, four seed and the two, three seed matchups that we're seeing right now. Do you have any issues with that? An extra game or two as like an elimination play in one game. I did not understand it. That's my so, first. So essentially, this, Steve. That's yes. Okay, your team, your team, the team that you own, mm-hmm. that you bought from Larry Tannenbaum, who was doing a we, great job, according to you. Yeah, uh, and he wanted me to do a great job as well. <laughs> so your team and Jesse's team are in the Eastern Conference. My team, along with Leo's team, Leo, your son, who is also a billionaire, um, are in the Western Conference. Because I did a great job. Overall in the NHL, Jesse and Steve, you guys finished 15 and 16. Overall in the NHL, my team and Leo team, Leo's team finished 17th and 18th. However, because the East is more competitive, my team and Leo's team makes it, while your two teams, objectively in points, better than our two teams, because you're in a different conference, do not. What the proposal is, is that... Team 15 would play team 18 and 16 would play 17. And then we could kind of fight it out for who actually gets to get in. So that would mean that all top 16 teams have a chance at least to play for the playoffs. What do you think? 
I can't decide if I like it because like I do like that baseball expanded the playoffs. I do, but well, they need, they had like four teams make it. It was a little ridiculous. Baseball needed to. Right. But every year the wild card team makes it the team they beat got jobbed every year, every year because of one game. Hmm. Like, is this a seven game series or like, is no, this a one, one game, game plan? You can't have five rounds of the Stanley Cup playoffs. You can't do that. It's too much. Mm. Mm. So it's either That's... you get jobbed for playing or jobbed for not playing. So the, what I like about this is that at least you get to play the game. Whereas in the other format, which currently exists, you don't. So you get. If you're if you're 15 and 16, if you and Jesse are 15 and 16 and you don't make the playoffs, you got jobbed anyway. So at least in this scenario, you get to play for something. Do you hear yeah. who we're talking about? We're talking about teams 15 through 18. Mm-hmm. Stop wasting my time, all four of you. That's you know what I mean? It's the playoff format is what it is. And if on in it, it in an extremely low percentage rare instance, you happen to beat the best team in your conference, then this will be relevant. Until then, you're cannon fodder. Shut up. I kind of like it. I like the format. I like where Matt's going with it. I kind of like it, but like these debates always, I find, go somewhere where it takes a long time. And I'm like, and at the end of it, I go, we're talking about the 18th place team in the league. <laughs> and I just don't have the energy. So you're just not right. going to participate in the debate because it, because it's because your team's first. I, just, I can guarantee you, if the Leafs were in this position, they were 17th. You'd be best. Let's no. We want to be cannon fodder. Let's go. Let's get in there and be cannon fodder. Occasionally, you get a Cinderella story though, and some of those are the best in sports. Occasionally, the Habs knock off the Pens. There you go. I guess you're right. No, you know what? A one game winner take all quote-unquote series i mean it's exciting as hell it's like, a we've, warm up. We've, we've seen how cool it can be with the jays and orioles right we've seen how cool it could be no one was talking about the integrity of the game and all that shit we were just talking about how friggin cool the bat flip was from edwin um you know what i'm for it and didn't didn't the jays go on to sweep texas they sure did let us not forget jesse what are your thoughts uh, well, uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys don't pay too close attention to the NBA, but they've already gone towards this model slightly because yeah. the, in each conference, so the seven and eight. So when you finish the season, the seven and eight team, uh, seven versus eight play a one game playoff. The winner of seven versus eight makes the playoffs. The loser of seven versus eight goes on to play the winner of nine versus 10. So nine versus 10 also play a one game playoff. The winner of nine versus 10 plays the loser of seven versus eight. And then that winner gets the final playoff spot. So you have to lose because of COVID. No, that so that's they did that last year for the bubble. And then now they're doing it again this season. They said they're going to keep it moving forward because of the extra revenue it generates for they have extra four playoff games and they're all elimination games. You created four game sevens. It's pretty cool. So I like it because it's double elimination. So if you're the say you're the eighth seed, you lose the game to the seventh seed, then you still get another chance to make the playoffs. You don't get screwed really, really screwed over because you lost this one game playoff. You got another Another shot to face a lesser team and then if you're the nine right. versus eight so right now the raptors are i think 11th in the eastern conference and it's uh they're they're like two games back of washington for the 10 seed no the raptors are, i think 12th it doesn't matter they're two games back of the uh 10 seed to get into the uh play-in game so as a raptors fan i have something to root for in this lost season I can be like, okay, let's we're ten, we're eleven games under five hundred. We still got a shot. We're two games back with eight games to go to get into this stupid plan game to lose to the nine seed. You know, I'm still out there watching Raptors games because there's still something to root for. So, for fans in that sense, I like the idea of creating these extra little mini tourneys, mini game sevens to create these extra for these last playoff spots because in the end. It's not going to mean much because we don't expect the eight seed to go to the finals of the league. And it also for these 
for these uh, teams that would have missed the playoffs, the nine through now, like the Raptors, like I said, they're in 12, nine through like 12 seeds. They're still playing for something at the end of the year where they could have been just giving up because they're uh, five games back of an actual playoff spot. Now they're only two games back of this play in spot. And now I'm still rooting for something, even though there's really nothing to play for. So I love you know what? the idea of these extra playoff games. You're absolutely right. Do it. Do it. You're all cannon fodder, but do it. <laughs> Jesse, next question. Steve Dangle, a un tipo maleonte. What does that mean? Well, in case you don't speak Spanish, that means Steve Dangle is a smelly guy, and I just learned it from Babbel, the number one selling language learning app in the world. It's one of my goals for the new year was to learn a little bit of you know, a new language. And Babbel has made the whole process addictively fun and easy. And I can throw little barbs at my friends in different languages. Little bite-sized lessons, perfect for guys like me who really have low attention spans. They're 15 minutes long and they make it perfect to learn a new language. You're not spending your time conjugating verbs. We're talking about real world conversations. Now you've seen other language learning apps and they use AI for their lesson plans. Babbel lessons were created by using over 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you could choose from 14 different languages, including the one I'm trying to learn, Spanish. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. That's the part I'm still working on. So just bear with me. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. So that's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use the promo code theory that's b-a-b-b-e-l.com code theory for an extra three months free Babel language for life uh steve last week i texted you a question for zoo stories yes uh do you have an answer to that question do you want to read do you want to read it do you have your phone in front of you do you want me to do you want me to pull it off and read it to you Okay. Yes, please pull it up. Okay. (laughs) I remember the gist of it. It was from at Jake underscore Peralta. I assume not the real Jake Peralta from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. For Steve Zoo Corner, has Steve ever had to feed dangerous animals? Oh. I've fed camels many times. Be prepared for your history corner coming up. Steve, go ahead. I've fed camels. They're very dangerous. No. Uh, So the... uh, I worked at the camel rides and the pony rides at the zoo. The camels, I was so much less afraid to feed than the much smaller ponies. That's because the camels, you just feed them flat palmed and they don't even have top teeth. It's just a plate, right? Whereas the pony, if I make a wrong move, it's teeth on both sides and might get a finger taken off. So I don't want that. But I'm assuming you're talking actually dangerous. So the giraffe, I'm going to throw into that category. I was safe because the way they feed the giraffes, or at least the way I fed the giraffes is they basically give you, it's like a, like a laundry detergent bottle, the, with the top cut off and you fill it with like, I don't know, some sort of grains or giraffe food. I don't don't know. And you hold it up to the giraffe who puts their head, they're standing outside and they put their head through this little window in this little house. And I've uploaded that picture before. Literally type in Steve Dangle giraffe. It, it should come up on Google. Um, but when I was much younger and before I worked at the zoo, uh, my sister and I got a little behind the scenes tour and I got to feed a carrot to a hippo. Whoa. Yeah. And those are some say the most dangerous animal on earth because I think the they have the highest run? body count. Was that? I would just throw it at the hippo and run. Just throw it. No, I placed it. Um, like with my own teeth into its mouth. No, you no. didn't. Oh. No, I did not. Um, I can't remember if I did this or if I was standing with someone who did it, but I was in, uh, I was like on the outer edge of the polar bear enclosure when someone threw in a watermelon for the, and they just freaking <clears throat> bite the watermelon, eat it like it's, like it's a truffle. Like <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. And I pet, I don't remember if I fed it, but I pet a rhino. Whoa, Whoa. that's cool. A, a rhinoceros Whoa. for, um, so the, there's this video for the zoo's carousel. And, uh, you know, we, we visited a few animals. I got to pet an elephant as well um, when we were shooting that uh, uh, right on the ear. So the way they do that is they have these like pillars 
um, where you can you can reach through, but obviously the elephant can't get through, right? So I just gently pet it on its ear and everything. But the rhino, um, I was talking about like it's it's horn and how people hunt them and talking about conservation and things you can do and whatever. And in between takes, I had my hand on the rhino's horn and something startled it. So it turned its head to the side. And this is just as I had taken my hand off the horn. And it, boy, boy, if it smushed my hand between its horn and the post. You're done. Your hand's done. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I was not a keeper. Um, but uh, I have got to feed some pretty cool animals. I'm trying to think of any others. And let me emphasize now that I don't work there anymore and I don't have to be polite to you, do not feed the animals when you go to the zoo. That's Toronto or anywhere, you idiot. There's an actual statue in the Toronto Zoo um, commemorating this, I think it was an orangutan that died because stupid idiots kept feeding it things that it was not supposed to eat. So anyway, the only times I, the only times ever that I was able to feed an animal was under the supervision and advisory of a keeper. Wow. There you go. Damn. Crazy. All that's, right. that's I have friends cool. with fish. I got to feed their fish. No. Sorry. Iggy, a fed Iggy. <laughs> Your dog. Dangerous Charlie. Wild animal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a big teddy bear. Uh, I gave Leo minestrone soup. He's got teeth now. That was dangerous. It, right, it does hurt when they bite you for the first time. Yes, Jesse. Are you ready? Okay. So this comes from at Dave TRW. He wants you to talk about the Canadian housing market. Now, for a little <laughs> bit of context, uh, this is going to be history corner slash uh, just inform the people on your knowledge, Adam. Okay. Because uh, the Canadian heart housing markets, if if I think I'm correct here, is unique to the rest of the world in that it's been in sort of a bubble, as they're saying, for the last like 20 years, and there's no sign of it slowing down. And it's at a ridiculous point where it's an interesting topic of conversation. So, Mm -hmm. Adam, if you could do a little history corner on what's currently happening in the Canadian housing market. Okay, so I want to preface this by my knowledge is partial, and I'm sure there's a lot more that real professionals could add to this. But but as I understand it, um, the uh, as of about 2000. 8, 2009, right after the crash, real estate prices started to go up precipitously. Like we're talking about huge, huge jumps year over year. You know, whereas you could own a house in Vancouver from 1980 to 1990, and it would have gone up maybe 2% a year. Um, like maybe it was 100 grand in 1980, and it's 160 or 170 grand in 1990. Um, you know, you have that same house from 2000 to now go from 200 grand to 2 million. And at the same time, you've got, um, you've got salaries about the same. Like it, it's kind of scary actually, when you look at average salaries, um, they haven't changed much since the 1980s for the average person, which is terrifying to think. Um, the whole trickle down economics thing that the Americans tried failed. Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, when you pay more for your employees, that looks really bad to shareholders. So, um, so where is this money coming from? And why is this happening? Canada is a big country. If you look at the landmass of Canada, there shouldn't be a concentration of expensive real estate in the sense that there is. And a couple of factors are contributing to this. Number one, money's cheap to rent right now. If you're renting money, basically borrowing money, your interest rates at the lowest it's literally ever been. When my dad bought his first house in the 1980s, interest rates were at like 15%. They're now at less than two. So you can imagine that housing prices go up a lot. And part of the reason that drives the price is A, money's cheap. B, your lending potential is exponentially higher than it used to be. Uh, And C, there's a lack of demand, or sorry, there's a lack of supply. So when you have In any capitalist system, lack of supply drives up the price. Um, Canada also has 
an interesting situation and, and nobody really likes to talk about this, but there's only so much of Canada you really want to live in. Now, there are people that will tell you, well, I, I like the rugged wilderness and those people exist and all the power to them. But on the whole, the majority of people do not want to live in Canada's rugged wilderness. Big difference between Canada's rugged wilderness and say, I don't know, Alabama's rugged wilderness. Big difference. And most of it's temperature related. And, uh, you know, how do you make money? How do you do things that, um, that will allow you to sustain life? And it's very, very difficult in Northern Canada uh, to be able to do that. So people tend to congregate in the Southern cities, like Edmonton's, uh, I think one of the most populous Northern cities in the world, if not the high, it's, I believe Edmonton's population is the highest for a city that far North in the entire world, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so what's happened is that, uh, especially in Southern Ontario, where, you know, there's, it's already the center of commerce um, and business. Um, you get a lot of people and it's a, a situation where there isn't a lot of inventory um, money's cheap to rent. People are leveraging themselves to the absolute maximum, which is extremely dangerous as we saw in 2008. And like, I think uh, it's the bank of Zurich or Zurich bank or whatever they're called. I remember reading an article in 2015 about how over leveraged Canadians are when it comes to real estate and how it was bound to crash in 2017. Like we were 18 months away from a big crash and all it has done, especially after the pandemic is double itself and double itself and double it again. The average cost of a home in the greater Toronto area. I can remember my parents saying to me, well, if you can't buy a home in downtown Toronto, why don't you move out to the suburbs? There's no difference in Toronto. If you're in the greater, not just Toronto, but the greater Toronto area, the average house costs $1.5 million. It's an insane amount of money. Add to that, you got land transfer tax. If you're in Toronto, you got double land transfer tax. And we have some of the highest income tax rates in the entire world. So it's, uh, and people are asking, well, where's that money coming from? Where's that money coming from? Well, the exponential growth in value of the homes that were purchased in the, the 90s and the 80s, those families are now, you know, boomer families are now either selling them off or borrowing against them to help out the next generation. So a lot of fit is family money going back into the market. Either they're leveraged against the original asset or taken from the original asset that was sold tax-free and gifted to the children if that family has those means. So what a lot of, a lot of realtors are seeing is kids, kids, people my age in their 30s walking in and buying a house and the most amount of money that they can cobble together is the money that their parents gave them for a down payment. And then they have to make the mortgage payments on their own. And oftentimes it's just, that's just enough to be able to buy a house. And I mean, we've had, we've had literally burnt out shelves of homes sold for over a million dollars in Toronto. Like a garage was up for 600 grand. But the reality of living in a city like Toronto is if you look at Shanghai, if you look at New York, if you look at other major cities around the world, London, they become extremely unaffordable to purchase in and oftentimes rent in. And there are ways around that, like London's got rent controls, Ontario has rent controls, New York has rent controls. Some people in New York have been in their apartments for so long, they're paying like $200 a month in rent. And like, I think there's a Seinfeld episode on that. And you can actually, the, I think the rent laws in New York are interesting. You can actually transfer that to somebody else. But um, for the most people, it's, it's pushing them out of the market and then it's pushing them into other markets. And Toronto, and Steve and Jesse can attest to this, if you go west, the city doesn't really end. No. It just turns into other cities. We just, the city keeps going. They're just called, it's just called different things. And originally these were all separate cities, but tell me the difference. Like, tell me where Toronto stops and Mississauga begins and then Mississauga begins or ends and then Oakville starts and then Oakville starts in Burlington or whatever, you know, it's just all. And then it's Hamilton. Hamilton. Actually. And then it's, you know, Welland and St. Catharines and Niagara. And it's all, I mean, there's 14 million people in a little boot. And to add to that, we're on a lake. So we're at, Toronto is at the southernmost point. Most cities are, you know, maybe they're on a river, because there's always, usually with cities that are over 100 years old, there's a water source, right? There always has to be a major water source. But it's a city built on a river. Or it's a city built, if it's a non-coastal city, 
It's a city that has Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, and eventually that peters out and ends and you get back into farmland. Toronto doesn't have that. It doesn't have a a Southeast and a Southwest. It's just North, Northeast, Northwest. That's it. And it's just people are going further East and people are going further West and they're going further North. And the commute times when, when pre COVID for some people were two hours a day, our traffic's worse than Los Angeles. It's crazy. It's crazy. And we have a public transport. North America. Yeah. 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 And when we tried to institute toll roads for people coming in from uh, say an area that's not Toronto, but is Toronto adjacent, uh, the province shut that down. The provincial government shut that down in an effort to win an election, which they ultimately lost, which means that Toronto's roads and infrastructure are unfairly uh, paid for by the people who actually live in Toronto, which means property taxes have skyrocketed. Uh, so it's it, so, and then and then people say, well, why don't you raise the interest rates? Well, if you raise the interest rates a couple percentages, something like sixty percent of the people who are currently in mortgages go belly up. It's huge. So it's an insane number. And well, why don't you tax them more? Well, when you tax people more, believe it or not, depending upon how the tax goes, you are unfairly disadvantaging the people that need to get into the market more. Because if you raise the tax on say land transfer, whereas you buy a property and you want to, and you've, and you've accumulated some equity on that property and you want to sell that property and buy another. Canadian law has that you can, uh, you can buy your first place without paying land transfer tax, but every other place after that, you're paying 2.2% plus Toronto's 2.2%, which means 4.4%. So if you're buying that $1.5 million home in Toronto, you're paying $70,000 in taxes gone cash gone and so what it's created a very stratified and unhealthy situation um and what we need to do is uh we need to look at ways to create housing that is and i hate to say this but you know we got to look at other models from other cities and i think we've got to do some things that are a little bit different and nobody there's not a lot of appetite to do it uh, um, politically because remember who supports the political candidates, people with extra money. And if you tax them, uh, or if you, if you vote to tax them, you're not going to get the rich people's money. Right. But you have to, at a certain point, look at the situation and go, okay, we need to limit these people's, um, profits and tax them in a different way so that we can build more high rise buildings um, and, and, you know, ones that are eco-friendly ones that are, that have electric charging stations, ones that are mixed use, like New York's moved to a model and Toronto's doing this too, where, you know, the first six or seven floors of a 30 floor building are, um, government subsidized units. And we're, we're seeing that in Toronto, specifically in Regent park. It's the only way forward for a lot of low income families, because otherwise you're basically kicking them out far past their ability to work in the downtown sector. And when you do that and you don't have a public transportation system to support it, it creates enormous income inequality. And then, you know, restaurants can't staff people and you can't like, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a bad situation. And so I've I've got a little bit off track here, but at the end of the day, the, the contributing factors are basically uh, low interest rates, uh, low inventory, And the fact that, you know, people don't talk about this enough. A lot of what keeps people out of the market are high taxes on the lowest income people. So even if you make $80,000 a year, which is an incredible amount of money to make for anybody, 80,000 bucks a year, you are going to get taxed an enormous amount of money. And oftentimes it's not equal per capita wise to somebody who makes $3 million a year. Oftentimes, the person who makes $3 million a year is paying less per capita. And oftentimes, they're far more able to absorb the tax hit than somebody making $80,000. So not really much of a history corner. There is definitely more to this. It's a very complex issue, but we got a big problem. And I know Chicago's got a big problem with this too. New York's worked to try to fix it, but I think they're still having issues. London, England has enormous problems with this. And there hasn't been that silver bullet solution anywhere with a major city. But with Toronto, the expectation shouldn't be at least until we fix this position. Well, the way to make money is the same way my parents did, which is buy a house and live in it forever. You have to unfortunately look to other things which are more dangerous and require more education, such as stock market things. And like it's, it, it creates a lot of problems for people um, trying to just 
pull themselves up to have a middle-class lifestyle. And that's what you have. Sorry. That's, did that make sense? First of all, you're wasting your time on the radio. This is what you should be doing. This, this well, wasting I don't know that I'm right. This, I don't know that I'm totally right. This isn't broadcasting to us only, Steve. He's doing this. <laughs> I, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. Um, where was it going? Oh, you know what you, New York and London do have is a not piece of shit subway system. Yes. yes. Getting around this, uh, I say this city, I'm in Oshawa. Getting around Toronto is a nightmare. Let me tell you what I've gained by working from home full time throughout all this because I was still going into the city two or three times a week. Um, I don't have to commute four hours round trip mm-hmm. um, two or three times a week. So we're talking about saving... <laughs> We're talking about saving like eight to 12 hours a week. Um, and on, and forget gas. Ga- I, I don't even know if I've double digit filled my gas tank um, uh, since the beginning of this. Um, but uh, I was spending two or I'm saving rather by not having to go to Toronto from Oshawa, like a ton of people do. Uh, I'm not, I'm saving two to 400 bucks a month. A month. I'm saving like five G's a year mm-hmm. <laughs> on parking. When I think, I think there are a lot of people that are hoping that, um, or a lot of politicians that are banking on after the pandemic ends, things never going back to normal in terms of commuting. And I, I would agree. I think there is going to be a lot of that. But do you really think that, and I'm going to use this as an example, and I don't know that this is the case, so I do not speak on behalf of this company, but, but let's say the Bank of Montreal Tower in downtown Toronto, which is, I think, University in front or King or something like that. Gigantic white marble tower across from the TD Tower, which is nearby the CIBC Tower, all these major banks. Do you think that these banks built these towers so they could be empty? Even if you can, even if you can work from home, they're going to bring people back because there needs to be a reason that these towers exist. Um, So, Unfortunately, I think what you're seeing, what you're going to see is, is a push to go back to that sort of thing, Steve. And, and you know, I, I'm curious. I think a lot of politicians are hoping, well, maybe we don't have to build a subway station. And the, and the bureaucracy, too, in Canada is much different than the states. We have, a, um, we have an enormous governing body that gets in the way of itself all the time. There's 40 fucking committees for everything. And it doesn't, nothing gets done. <laughs> like to, to get, I don't think people understand this. If you live in Scarborough, in Toronto, which is part of Toronto, mm. you have to take a bus, an LRT, and uh, well, I think two buses and an LRT in some cases just to get to the subway. And we if were going to get live, three more subway stops. If you don't What's live that? directly on a line anywhere in the greater Toronto area, it's impossible. It takes two different, at minimum, two different modes of transportation to get somewhere. And usually, Scarborough's get Narnia. Yeah. East, yeah. East Scarborough is Narnia to, to people from Toronto. I want, if you're from New York, I want you to look at your subway map and then Google Toronto's. Oh yeah, those those things are Dude. embarrassing where they superimpose the Toronto subway map over different cities in North America. I'm horrifying. It's, I've told oof. the story. I've told the story a few times. There was a family, there was a, t- a tourist family from Spain and they flagged me down one day in front of Union Station because they wanted some help. And, and they go, is, is this the subway line? I go, yep. And they basically go like, where's the, like in broken English, they're like, where's the rest of it? And I go, no, that's it. And they talk to each other in Spanish. Blah, 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 blah. And the dad goes to me, he looks me right in the face. He goes, are you serious? Mm-hmm. He was being genuine. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. And the solution is, well, we're going to put in more bike lanes. <laughs> okay. Well, when it's minus 30, I'm sure a ton of people are going to love that. All right. You know, I we, went you to- have to. We have some serious issues to overcome in Toronto. Huge. When I went to Ryerson, I lived at home with my parents in Mississauga. And to get to Ryerson from one city over, I had to drive myself to a GO train and then take a GO train to Union Station and then from Union Station, take a subway up to Ryerson. Like I had to drive and then take a train and then take a subway just to get like uh, something where if you drive directly from where I live to the university, it's about like a 20 minute drive. I, that's a two hour commute for me. I had to leave two hours before whatever class time was. And I'd get there like 15 minutes before class. Like that's, yep. that's, that's absurd. It shouldn't yep. take me two I know hours girl- with something you can drive directly to that's 20, 25 minutes away. Mm-hmm. I know a girl who, instead of um, paying for student housing in her second year of university, commuted 
Greyhound bus from Waterloo mm-hmm. to Ryerson, downtown Toronto. Every day? <laughs> yes. Oh I'll never. And I was God. I was complaining about commuting, and someone told me about her, and I just walked up to her. I was like, "You're a hero." Yeah. I was. How are you still? Talk about uh, wanting it. Right. Also, right. oh yeah, yeah. The Go Train costs two hundred and thirty-six dollars for me every month, or something like that. It's it doubled absurd. since I started school. Yeah. At mm-hmm. least. And the Go Train, by the way, gets you in from the outlying areas, and then you have to buy a hundred and fifty dollar pass to ride the subway. Which yeah. has a grand total of like 50 when, stops. Two years in, they implemented uh, a new thing where if you tapped on the Go Train, you tapped your card on the Go Train, you're, the subway only costs you 35 cents then. But that was the first two years, it didn't cost that. It cost $3 like normal. And then eventually they're like, all right, let's make a little discount if you take both modes of transportation. And that's not on top yeah. of the car you got to drive to get to the Go Station because you can't, the buses to get to the Go Train are impossible if you're taking like the My Way if you're on the Mississauga transit system, because that's a terrible bus system. Or if and you're on the some Zoom cases pay for parking. Parking. Yeah, and you have to pay for at some of the like, go stations if there's no yeah. parking available. So it's like a pilgrimage to California in the 1700s or some shit. Like you do that five days a week. And by the way, our our um, our subways are closed constantly for signal oh, yeah. issues. Now people are like, why is the why why is there signal issues that often? Our signals. Some of them were put in in the 1930s and have not been changed. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So we got, we got infrastructure issues here in Toronto, big time, and mm-hmm. a huge, huge pile of people. I did like just looking around, walking around, paid to really not do a whole heck of a lot and talk on a committee about feasibility. Uh, Scarborough, I, I'm particularly passionate about Scarborough because I'm from there. Uh, but I think it's complete and utter bullshit that we got one subway stop, one more, uh, and people are complaining about it. It's crazy. And mm-hmm. so I think, uh, you know, if you're considering moving here into the golden <laughs> horseshoe, as they like to call it, make sure that you are able to afford it and that you live within the proximity, like a close enough proximity. And by the way, I said the bike lane thing earlier. I think bike lanes are a great thing, but oh, yeah. they, they tend to talk about bike lanes here like, oh, well, that'll solve all problems. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> it there solves was, a lot of problems. You use them but three not, months a year. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> some people are hardcore, and yeah. I hat, hats off. But You, you know what You know what I forgot about? Um, so they closed down a street in Toronto, King Street, to cars mm-hmm. um, as part of this pilot project to basically see how it goes. But a bunch of businesses on the street are like, no, this will kill business, blah, 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 blah. And and this 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 restaurant owner and a city councilor and I want to say maybe Doug Ford back when he was a city councilor posed with a giant ice sculpture middle finger. Yeah, <laughs> outside of the Hill. restaurant, George protesting. Mamalini, who's a who's a clown, an yeah. absolute clown. Uh, there's two guys on city council who are absolute clowns. He there was. are some winners on Toronto city yeah. council. Anyway, Jesus Christ. That's your, uh, oh can, I ask one, can I ask one quick question about that? Cause one mm-hmm. thing I always see is, okay, the housing prices in Toronto are crazy. The condo prices are crazy and uh, nobody can buy them. Then who's buying them to keep up the prices? Well, there are people that can buy them. Yeah. Um, there are plenty of people that can buy them because there's a lot of money here. Um, You'll just be in debt forever. Not necessarily for, in a lot of these cases. I think a lot of it's family money. A lot of people have helped and a lot of people don't. And that's the system that we're living in. Hmm. And well, I present like you, that without comment. So I suppose it, well, I'll, I'll come in. If you don't have the help, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like it's the, the situation here is so bad that anecdotally anyway, like someone was like, oh yeah, it's getting real bad out in Kingston. I'm like, Kingston. Yeah. That's two and a half hours away mm-hmm. without traffic. And, and, and a bunch of Ontarians, oh, they're getting smart. I'll move to Nova Scotia. I'll move to New Brunswick. So like literally this one tiny region is screwing up the entire country. Yeah, right. Cause Canada all those problem. places. Yeah. It is going to be, a, it's a Canada problem. And I think it's just because it's the lack of area where people want to live. Honestly, that's what it is. Um, so, you know, there, you know, it always makes me laugh when we see those and we got to wrap it up here, but you see those home <laughs> renovation shows or whatever. And it's like, Oh, Johnny and Gina in Georgia, uh, are buying this McMansion for 150 grand. Well, it's everything that we can do. We're going to put a $3,000 down payment down and, uh, somehow we're going to do the kitchen as well. And you're like, 
how the hell? And then in Toronto, it's like, if you want to buy a shack, oh boy, it's going to be about this, seven grand. I saw this TikTok of what a million dollars gets you in New Brunswick. And I wanted to move to New Brunswick. <laughs> I, oh, oh my God. It's nice. Oh my God. And then they're, they're like, here's what it gets you in Toronto. And it was like a tool shed. <laughs> you look at what a million dollars gets you in Prince Edward Island. Beautiful. Well, no one lives there. I've been there. I didn't see anyone. Uh, hello? And they charged me at the bridge and everything, and no one was there. <laughs> There's one and guy working at an ice cream stand. I got to go because I got to go pick up my daughter good. from my daycare. Right. So Goodbye. I love you guys. you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Don't forget to make your donations. I challenged you. You got to do it. Okay. 100%. $200 and one cent. There you Goodbye. go. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.